Okay. Hello, Mike Hako. I'm Senator Mike Gabbard, I'm chair of the Agriculture Environment Committee, uh, starting my eighth year as the chair of AEN. And uh, let's see, so far, my dad was 20 years Air Force. I start on time, so uh, <laughs> uh, our members, some of our members will be joining with us today. Uh, so mahalo for joining us uh, in person and online. Uh, the purpose of this info briefing is to alert people to the immediacy and the magnitude of the threat that climate change poses to Hawaii. You know, we see it on the evening news, but how does it really affect us? You know, we we're told that 2023 was the hottest year ever on record. Right? Well, so what? Right? What does that really mean to us and our ohana and our future generations? So today we have invited uh, national, state, and local experts to tell us what's been happening regarding climate change, what's ahead, and how that will affect all of us. So I'm looking forward to a very exciting afternoon. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rep. Nicole Lowen, the co-host of today's briefing for her opening remarks. Thank you. Aloha, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm Nicole Lowen. I represent District 7 and um, chair of the Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection in the House and joined by my vice chair, Rep. Cochran from Maui, and some other members might be joining as we go along. Um, I, I won't go on too long, but, uh, you know, for, and also I want to thank Senator Gabbard, whose office, you know, it's his idea to hold this briefing, and he took, their office took the initiative in organizing everyone. It was a lot of work, so. Um, thank you. And um, yeah, I mean, I think despite many years of warnings about the coming impacts of climate change and, and lots of attempts to, to take action and progress you know, on, on climate action to some degree, we still find ourselves in the situation where we're kind of staring down the barrel of a gun. And it always feels like the, there's so many needs in the state that a lot of times the, the needs in the short term that are facing our constituents, like lack of housing or the cost of living, always um, seem to outweigh in that present moment and kind of have a louder voice than some of these climate issues that are going to have really real impacts, but we don't experience them so immediately um, all the time. And so I think the hope is just that this briefing will help to educate and put more information out there about what's, um, what the impacts are and, and how they're very real and how we need the legislature to be a leader and take action. Okay. Thank you, Rep. So we're going to start off with our first speaker, and that will be Professor Pao Shin Chu, the state climatologist and professor at uh, UH Manoa's uh, School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, or SOEST. Um, professor uh, Chu uh, has his doctorate from University of Wisconsin in Madison in 1981. He has also co authored or co-authored at least 48 articles related to various aspects of climate change. Welcome, Dr. Shu. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here and for this uh, joint climate change uh, informational briefing organized by Senator Mark Gabe and also Representative Nicole Lowen. Mm -hmm. okay. So maybe I can start with my PowerPoint. Oh, okay. He's, he's ready to start his PowerPoint. Yeah, I need Sarah's help. Okay. All right, bear with us, everyone. And Professor, if you could pull the mic closer to you, that would be helpful. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can you see from here? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not full screen yet. We we'll welcome uh, Senator Tim Richards, Vice Chair of AEN from Hawaii Island. Originally, I was planning to have a Zoom meeting, but I, this morning I realized the importance of this meeting, so I decided to come in person. Appreciate you coming. <laughs> Okay, looks like a, uh, this is a, oh, well, yeah. Yeah, maybe we move forward with this for now and we'll um, have staff work on trying to improve it. Yeah. Mm. So just move on. Yeah. Okay. Th you know, let's get back to the the first one, the first slide. And if you need to move closer, Professor, you could go up there. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Go up the, uh, Mike on the right. Can you move to the first slide? First slide. The first slide. Are you going with the first slide? Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So the title of my talk is Impact and the Future Projections of Climate Change on Hurricane and the Drought in Hawaii. I'm Pao Xin Chu, affiliated with the Department of Atmospheric Sciences and the Hawaii State Climate Office uh, in the School of Ocean and Earth Science and the Technology. Steve is my boss. Okay. <laughs> And uh, also, yeah, at the University of Hawaii. Okay. So I'm very glad to be here to have the chance to talk about uh, this uh, important area for Hawaii. Next one. Oh, well, let's first be uh, clear about the nomenclature of tropical cyclone. So when, when we say tropical cyclone, it means that uh, we have a severe storm that formed in the tropical ocean. And basically, there are three types of tropical cyclone. Starting from the weakest one, we call the tropical depression, and then to tropical storm. And at this stage, we give storm a name. And then the hurricanes, okay, hurricanes are the strongest type of tropical cyclone. And for hurricane, the wind speed is at least uh, 70, 74 miles per hour. Okay. And hurricanes also can be classified into five, five uh, categories from one to five, with five being the strongest one. Okay. And sometimes you may 
have heard people talking about the major hurricane, which means a category three to category five hurricane. Okay. So the wind speed is at least 111 miles per hour. So that's very powerful wind speed. Okay. And as we know, when we talk about a hurricane, we always think about something like a destructive wind, torrential rainfall, flooding, and that storm surge. Okay. And then in Hawaii, the interactions of hurricanes with mountain, because we have mountain, high mountains here, so this enhance this uh, uh, so enhance this uh, uh, high intensity rainfall and also trigger a flash flood and also uh, this uh, uh, landslide. Okay, so there's another problem in Hawaii with hurricanes. Okay. Next slide. Uh, here I just give some examples of hurricanes that uh, inflict major damage to Hawaii and also are very close to Hawaii. So starting with the Hurricane Eva in 1982, November, a very late okay, time of the year for hurricane. So it caused uh, major damage to Hawaii. And uh, this, this storm occurred when the 1982-83 El Nino reaches almost its maximum intensity. Then 10 years later, we have this uh, hurricane in Nikki, okay, right, which caused uh, damage to Kauai again. And uh, damage back then was uh, 3.1 billion, but that was uh, 1992 values. And nowadays, it's almost like uh, $6 billion. Okay, damage, that's a lot. And took Kauai ten, almost 10 years to recover from Hurricane in Nikki. Then more recently, in 2015, that uh, uh, it was also another very strong El Nino year, and we have a uh, lot of hurricanes. And uh, actually, uh, at, at, at the one time, Hawaii was sandwiched by three category four hurricane. So that was very unusual. Okay. And uh, in, 19, in 2018, Hurricane Len, okay, uh, which is a category five hurricane, also caused uh, a lot of problems for Hawaii. Okay. And also that uh, bring not only heavy rainfall but also fire. Okay. Fire. And then more re recently we have a Hurricane Douglas okay, in 2020, okay, which was very close to Oahu, only about uh, 30 miles. Okay. okay. Next. So this picture shows uh, uh, the aftermath of a uh, Hurricane Iniki in 1992 on Kauai to the left, and uh, to the right you can see. You have a uh, three category four hurricanes in the Central Pacific, okay, and the Eastern Pacific, Hurricane Kilo, Hurricane Ignacio, and the Hurricane Jimana, okay. Uh, so, so that was uh, uh, this. Th those three hurricanes were all category four hurricanes. So that was very scary picture when we saw this one. Next, and on the left shows the best track position of Hurricane Land. Uh, which was uh, on uh, during August 15 to 28, 2018. Okay, right. So we can see Hurricane Land was a Category Five hurricane, and uh, and uh, on August 21st, and was heading toward Oahu. The problem with Hurricane Land was it was very strong. It was a hur Category Five hurricane with uh, more than 160 miles per hour wind. And also, its motion was very slow, okay. and it was very close to Oahu. So the National Weather Service has issued a uh, consecutive warning for almost three days. So it caused a lot of anxiety and a scare for Hawaii. Okay. And it was uh, uh, one time it was forecast <laughs> just uh, toward Oahu. Okay. And uh, fortunately, at the, the last minute, it turned westward and moved away from Oahu. And uh, the picture on the, on the right shows a, a six-day rainfall during hurricane land, so that all major four islands received uh, lots of rainfall, okay? particularly uh, the, the big island okay? received more than, uh, I think, something like uh, 58 inches of rainfall in six days. Okay? Right. And, uh, and then uh, move to last year, 2023, uh, we have a tropical storm, Calvin, which also dumped a lot of rainfall on a big island. And then also uh, we have a hurricane, 
Dora, which passed to just to the south of Maui, okay, on August, uh, in early August, okay, and it was a very strong subtropical high pressure system to the north. So this generated very strong pressure gradient, and then because of the mountain, so it produced a very strong downslope wind up to almost 70 miles per hour, okay, and it caused a problem for for the uh, for particularly Lahaina, okay, right. So we, we all know that that was uh, the big inferno and caused uh, more than uh, 100 people you know, dead for, from this uh, uh, inferno. Okay. okay, next one. And uh, uh, in the past, I talked about the hurricanes were very active during some El Nino years. So here, the top one shows uh, the storm tracks during six El Nino years over the central north pacific so here tropical cyclone i mean just a tropical storm and a hurricane okay so we see that uh, central north pacific is defined a region according to the national weather service uh, to the north of equator between dateline and 140 west okay and uh, the bottom one shows uh, hurricane tracks during la nina so during four la nina event there were only seven tropical cyclones. So in other words, if you look at the average, 5.5 uh, tropical cyclones were observed during El Nino year versus only 1.75 during La Nina. So the ratio is three to one. So in other words, during El Nino years, you expect to see more hurricanes coming into the central North Pacific. Whereas uh, you have a fewer hurricanes during La Nina years. Next one. Even if the uh, previous one, you know, we looked at this uh, relatively large region over the central North Pacific. But if you uh, just uh, narrow down to a smaller area just near Hawaii, so here I draw a radius of circle 250 nautical miles from Honolulu, okay, which is re relatively small compared to the central North Pacific. But you can also see some difference that uh, in terms of the uh, uh, mean, annual mean frequency of s tropical cyclone during El Nino years is higher than that during the uh, non-El Nino years. So you can say with some statistical confidence that uh, uh, indeed there is, even though we look at a smaller region just near Hawaii, in the vicinity of Hawaii, but we can also see there are more hurricanes during El Nino years compared to La Nina years. Okay, okay next one. <coughs> Okay, so uh, so I, I co-authored a book uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Murakami. He he works at the NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics uh, Dynamics Laboratory in New Jersey. So the book is titled "The Climate Variability and Tropical Cyclone Activity." So in this book, we consider uh, uh, how climate variability influence tropical cyclone activity, like uh, you know, how the formation location would be shifted, uh, how the frequency of, of incidents will be changed, and how the storm track will be different, okay, right? and also rainfall and or loca landfall location intensity and so on. Okay, right? So here in this book, we, you know, we look at the, the Pacific, North, not only the Western North Pacific, but also Eastern North Pacific, Central North Pacific, and South Pacific and also North Atlantic. Okay, so climate var <coughs> variability would mean something like El Nino, La Nina, uh, Median Julian Oscillation, and uh, Pacific Decade Oscillation, and so on. And uh, there are s uh, seven chapters in this book. But uh, uh, relevant to this meeting, I think the most important part and most interesting part would be the last chapter. Okay, so last chapter focuses uh, on uh, future tropical cyclone changes, okay, in relation to the increased uh, concentration of greenhouse gases. Okay. Next one. So this, this, uh, uh, this figure is drawn from the book, okay. So uh, what is shown here is the, is a uh, tropical storm uh, change uh, based on the CMAP-5 models in the future, okay. Right? relative to the present day climate. Okay, right. So if you look at uh, the middle one, which is the Northeast Pacific, okay, which include Hawaii, 
and this is uh, this shows that uh, the relative change okay from the present day climate okay. so you can see that uh, overall the tropical storm frequency doesn't change that's uh, the first one by uh, indicated by one okay but uh, but there are two means that uh, the annual number of category four and five hurricanes so you can see there's a increase in category four and five hurricane in the future okay right? three means that uh, uh, storm intensity right so storm intensity also <coughs> becomes stronger and the four is uh, uh, st storm rainfall storm rainfall also get increased by almost 20 percent okay so this means that in the future that uh, the overall number of tropical cyclone over the eastern north pacific doesn't change too much but the, the category four and the five hurricane will become more frequent, okay? And also storm intensity becomes stronger. And the more important, the storm rainfall would be almost 20% higher than the present day climate. So this is, a, this is a, uh, the, the conclusion <coughs> from this uh, uh, study, okay? Next one. Okay, so there's another study which is uh, aimed toward uh, Hawaii, okay? So this is based on the high resolution atmospheric general circulation models. Okay. So on the on the left, upper left corner shows everything from the observations, okay, in terms of annual mean storm number. Okay, right. So you can see it's pretty uh, pretty high in the eastern Pacific, right? In the tropical region, it is uh, depicted in red, okay, right. In Hawaii, the value is relatively low, maybe between something like a one, one or two tropical cyclone per year. Okay, right. And on the right, upper right corner shows the simulated present day tropical cyclone frequency. Okay. And you can see that uh, the model shows reasonably well okay, in terms of showing this uh, location of the maxima and also the, the, the annual mean numbers, okay. But uh, the model also is not perfect. Model also tends to underestimate uh, annual mean tropical cyclone frequency to the west of 120 west, okay. So this is a simulation from the present, present day. And the lower left is the simulation for the future, okay. Right. Future that uh, basically you can see there's the east-west contrast, okay, which is uh, more clear, okay, right. And uh, the, the lower right panel shows the difference between the, uh, the future minus the present day uh, climate in terms of tropical cyclone number. And we can see there's a very large decrease, okay, which is shown in blue uh, in the tropical region, Eastern Pacific to the Central Pacific, but in Hawaii, that you can see that's a very large increase, okay, like, uh, which is shown in red, red color, right? Because the, the annual mean number of tropical cyclone from observation is very low in Hawaii region. It's about maybe one to two per year. And uh, this, this increase is also about one, okay? So, that the, so this means that uh, this is really alarming. In the future, we expect to see more tropical cyclone in Hawaii area. And uh, the panel to the right, far right, is the uh, uh, projected change in uh, steering flow because tropical cyclone motion is governed by steering flow okay, in the atmosphere. Okay, right. So it shows that uh, in the future we have uh, uh, increased easterly steering flow, so which would lead to uh, enhanced westward propagation of tropical cyclones, as as you saw from this panel in uh, lower, lower right, okay. Okay, next one. And uh, here also, I'd like to say something about uh, this uh, timing of change of intense tropical cyclone. So here, intense tropical cyclone means category four and category five. So they are the most intense hurricanes, okay. And uh, if you look the, the upper left corner, the solid line, okay, up and down, shows the uh, uh, climatological value of intense tropical cyclone number. So for example, in the Northern Hemisphere, 
the peak value of intense tropical cyclone occurs in September and October. And in the southern hemisphere, it occurs in March, okay, right, the different time of the year. So these uh, uh, intense tropical cyclones, usually its occurrence is different from other high impact weather system like a summer monsoon rainfall or local thunderstorm, usually they occur in summertime. Okay. So one is in autumn, one is in summer. Okay. And uh, the, the, the bar shows the, the, the trend okay, for intense tropical cyclone, months by months. Okay. So if you look at the northern hemisphere, the trend is all positive. That's in, in colored in red, okay, right. from May, June, July, August. Right. Not in the northern hemisphere, and in the southern hemisphere, it shows a, a positive trend in uh, December, January, and February. Okay, so this means that uh, uh, there is uh, evidence of increased intense tropical cyclone occurrence in the early season, right? Okay, because usually they occur in the autumn, but now the, it, you know the, the the trend becomes positive in summertime. Okay, right? So. <laughs> And uh, so this is not only in the northern hemisphere, but in the southern hemisphere, also you see that positive trend in December, January, and February. This is the southern hemisphere summer. Okay, right. So they tend to occur earlier. And also the trend becomes negative in September and then November in northern hemisphere, and in uh, March and April in southern hemisphere. So this means there's a decreased you know, intense tropical cyclone in the late season. And uh, the, the bottom figure shows uh, the trend in terms of the interseasonal difference okay, in intense tropical cyclone. So in other words, it is summer, tropical, uh, summer intense tropical cyclone number minus the autumn intense tropical cyclone number. Then you look at the trend. Okay. It shows that the, <coughs> the trend is uh, all positive in the western North Pacific, in the uh, eastern North Pacific, close to Mexico, and also Gulf of Mexico, and also in the Caribbean area, also some part in uh, southeast U.S. along the Florida coast, and also in South Pacific and uh, in uh, South Indian Ocean. Okay. So in other words, uh, shift toward early onset is not just a, a local phenomena. It is kind of like a global phenomena. Professor Chu, if you yeah. could wrap it up. Okay. Please, yeah. thank you. Right, okay. Right. Next one, please. So there's another way to look at uh, this information that I plotted uh, that uh, the time series of the uh, medium days of intense tropical cyclone occurrence, okay, uh, for, uh, for the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, the time goes downward, okay, right, from, for the northern hemisphere from August uh, through, through November and so on, okay. So we can also see there's a this uh, increasing trend for the both northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. So in other words, the intense tropical cyclone you know, have been arriving <coughs> earlier, okay, almost like uh, three to four, four days per each passing decade since 1981. Okay. So this signal is also clear in the southern hemisphere. Okay, uh, next one. So uh, this one probably is hard for you to see, okay. But, uh, but, but now let's shift the gear to uh, to drought, okay, right. So I start with this diagram, uh, which, uh, this flow chart at the top shows uh, natural climate variability. So we can think this is something like El Nino or Pacific Decadal Oscillation and so on, okay, right. So that if we have El Nino, then we have uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, change in precipitation in terms of reduced rainfall amount, timing, and also the, the the seasonal difference, okay, right. And then if we have a reduced rainfall, then, then this leads to the uh, reduced, uh, uh, reduced infiltration, and, okay, and so on. And uh, parallel to this one, if you have El Nino, then you also expect to have a warmer temperature and uh, you have a, a less cloud, okay, right. So you have a more sunshine, okay, right. So this would uh, increase the evapotranspiration. So taking these two together, then this leads to the uh, soil, moisture, soil moisture deficiency, and then you have a reduced uh, uh, 
stream flow and also so on. Okay, right. Then you have uh, something like called a social economic drought, uh, uh, meteorological drought, hyd uh, agricultural drought, and hydrological drought. Okay, so so you know drought. They are they have uh, several different types of drought. Okay. Okay. Next one. And in the past, uh, I studied the uh, Hawaii rainfall variations uh, uh, associated with El Nino, La Nina, and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Okay. So for example, this shows the Hawaii rainfall index. It's a composite during El Nino event, during La Nina event. Okay. Because El Nino lasts about one year. Okay. So this is a one year cycle. That shows that, uh, <coughs> this shows that the rainfall was uh, uh, low starting from November. Okay. Which is shown in this uh, black okay bar and runs through uh, April of the next year. So in other words, when the El Nino start, we have a uh, uh, six months of drought with the largest negative uh, deficiency occurs in uh, January and February. So this is since this is El Nino year. So we are, so this is January and next next month we we expect to have a very low rainfall. Okay. And uh, for La Nina, which is just the opposite. So th those six months, you have uh, uh, ab abundance of rainfall. So this is our wet season, okay, right? And uh, the the one at the bottom shows uh, if you consider the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, okay, and also with El Nino, okay. So if you have a uh, uh, El Nino which is embedded within the positive phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, then you can see that you know rainfall was very low, okay. The patterns are very similar to the top one, just uh, with El Nino. But uh, the difference is that the magnitude of anomalies has doubled. So the top one, the, the, the largest negative anomaly was minus 0.4, now becomes minus 0.8. Okay, right? So the magnitude becomes uh, intensified. Okay, right? And the El Nino also has bearing on wildfire okay, in Hawaii. So the, the figure on the right shows uh, total acres burned by white fires during El Nino cycle. Okay, so we can for Oahu. So we can see in spring and uh, summer, in the year following El Nino, there's a large ac acres burned by white fires. Okay, very clear. Okay. So I think because El Nino will have a very dry weather, very dry climate. Okay, right. So we have a dried out vegetations. Okay, and we have a. Uh, uh, very low soil moisture, okay, right? So it promotes this uh, wildfire uh, <coughs> occurrence in the following year, but not during El Nino year, in the following spring and the summer. Okay, right? And also the bottom tables, bottom figure uh, table shows some uh, predictions. So we try to predict summer total acre burn from the previous winter climate data and also with the uh, uh, Nonlinear uh, regression model. Okay, for four different islands. Okay, so that uh, here we call the event means that uh, the total acre burn is above the seventy-five percentile of its distribution. Then we call this is an event. Okay, so uh, so the model correctly classified the event uh, five out of five times so for Kauai and uh, five out of six times for Oahu. And uh, three and uh, three out of six times for Maui and uh, and the Big Island. Okay, so it looks like uh, there's some you know some skills from this uh, uh, fire prediction. Okay, from long range. Okay, okay next one. Yeah, almost done. Okay, yeah. okay maybe uh, maybe we can skip this one. Okay, yeah. Okay, so this shows uh, the percent areas okay of drought during the last twenty years in Hawaii. So the drought is uh, uh, expressed in terms of some information like uh, you have a different degree of drought, okay, right? Uh, from the smallest uh, yellow to, to orange to red to the dark red, okay, right? So we can see that uh, uh, during the last 20 years, the drought was pretty severe from, 19, uh, from 2009 to 2014 in the middle of this figure, okay? And also, that uh, it was pretty severe. Okay, right. And uh, al we also looked uh, at the drought per, per decade since since 1920s. Okay, 
So this is every decade shows the, the drought conditions uh, con uh, in expressed in the SPI, standardized precipitation index. So during the first five decades, there was hardly any sign of drought, okay? And uh, the negative values start to show since 1970s and becomes more severe during the last three decades, okay? And uh, particularly during the last decade, and uh, a, a major part of Kawa of Big Island, East Maui, and then some part of uh, Oahu, you know, really uh, had this uh, very, very severe drought, okay? Okay, next one. Okay, so here talk about the future rainfall projection to, to the future, okay, right? So uh, the based on the statistical downscaling, it shows that on the wet, on the, on the wet, uh, on the windward region during the wet season, you have more rainfall, and on the leeward side, you have a less rainfall okay, in the future. And from dynamical downscaling, also shows uh, more or less a similar kind of uh, conclusions, okay? Right? So that the wet area becomes wetter, dry area becomes drier, okay? Okay, the next one, that should be my last one, okay, right? So that uh, uh, here, try to summarize everything. So we have a major climate mode which modulate hurricane activity, okay, in Hawaii. And uh, when we have El Nino, then we expect to see more hurricanes and also, uh, <coughs> for a two degrees C warming that we, we see, uh, you have, we have a higher number of intense hurricanes, category four and five, over eastern and central North Pacific in the future, okay? And the hurricane rainfall also is expected to be more in the future, okay? Right? And also there's a substantial increase in TC frequency near Hawaii in the future, okay? And uh, we have intense TC which occurred earlier than before, and it may cause some kind of compound area. And in terms of, of rainfall, in terms of, no, just a wildfire. So wildfire, uh, we expect to see more wildfires in the spring and the summer following El Nino event, okay, right? And uh, long lead fire prediction is promising, okay, right? And the drought becomes more widespread and intense in the most recent decade, okay, particularly uh, from two, in this uh, from for the last 20 years, okay, particularly eastern Maui and also the island of Hawaii, okay, and uh, prediction of future rainfall using high resolution, okay, that's uh, also possible as because the previous study uh, based on CMAP three and CMAP five that was uh, more than 10 years ago, so the model also have developed uh, more rapidly during the last 10 years, and now we have some high resolution global model. I think that can. Uh, provide a better uh, projection for the future. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Chu. Maybe I talked too long. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Charles Chip Fletcher, uh, the interim SOAS Dean. He is the former chairperson of the Honolulu Climate Change Commission. He received the EPA's Environmental Achievement Award in Climate Change Science in 2011, and he's with his students, he has published three textbooks and more than 100 peer-reviewed articles. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and we also have your PowerPoints on our screens here, too, so we okay. have a good view of them. And if we're looking here instead of there, that's fine. Thank you. Um, great. The uh, information just arrived that last year, 2023, was the hottest year on record. Um, we had a number of climate indicators this past year um, bringing this information to us. If I can get my slides to move. One of the characteristics of this uh, past summer in the Northern Hemisphere was a series of heat domes with that form. And these uh, are the result of a jet stream in the Northern Hemisphere that has become unstable because of the rapid uh, heating of the Arctic so that the temperature difference between the tropics and the Arctic is becoming less and less and therefore heat exchange is slowing and the jet stream is slowing. The jet stream has developed large meanders and when there's a meander to the north it pulls up tropical air which sits over the continental areas uh, sometimes for a few weeks, 
creating enormous heat domes that may lead to uh, a lot of medical issues and even fatalities. 2023, if looked at uh, from the point of view of June, July, and August, in other words, the summer of 2023 is plotted here against all of the summer times since 1940. You can see it sits way outside uh, the long-term trend of the summers of previous years. It was an extraordinary year uh, in that respect. This red line shows 2023 daily surface temperature on the planet. All of the gray lines and blue lines below that are previous years. And uh, around June, the red line completely departed from the background of these earlier years and broke out of the envelope of variability and we see um, extremely hot day-to-day -day temperatures taking place unrelenting over the course of the entire uh, last six months of this year. This graph shows sea surface temperature. Again, beginning over on the left, we have January running through the 12 months to December. Uh, these gray lines all represent different years, going back 40 years. 2022 is shown in the orange, and 2023, again, sat above the entire envelope of years, going back several decades. It was an extraordinarily hot year. And the extent of global sea ice, both in the Arctic and Antarctic areas, uh, hit dramatic lows. This red line is 2023. You can see that in terms of millions of square kilometers, global sea ice from June through November was far below any previous year. Scientists are speculating that we are now seeing an acceleration in the rate of global warming. Every month from June to December of this past year was the hottest ever recorded globally. 2023 is the warmest year ever measured. It almost reached 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a UN benchmark I'll talk about in a second. And this is just from the European Union data set. We still have to hear from NOAA and NASA. And November 17th and 18th, of 2023 were the first days on record to have a global average surface temperature above two degrees Celsius. We all are aware of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, which is the entity that holds annual conferences. Their conference in 2015 in Paris led to all of the world's nations agreeing to cut their greenhouse gas emissions sufficient to stop warming before reaching two degrees Celsius. The small island nations of the world walked out, refusing to sign that, calling it a death warrant. And so additional wording was put in place to pursue efforts to end warming before 1.5 degrees Celsius. This temperature threshold, 1.5, became the new global target for stopping global warming. And it's appropriate to ask, how are we doing? And so on the bottom axis, we have time. On the vertical axis, we have carbon dioxide emissions. And in black, we see historic emissions peaking in 2019 and then decreasing during the recession related to uh, the COVID pandemic. CO2 emissions fell about 5.5% during 2020. And then with the release of stimulus funding from the world's nations to get the economy up and running again, we saw a new record of CO2 emissions. Uh, it, CO2 emissions globally rose over 6% in 2021. They rose another 1.2% above that in 2022. And in 2023, they rose additionally 1.1% above the previous year. The pathway to stopping warming at 1.5 degrees means that we must reach net zero uh, before 2050, and it's shown in the green line. If you take all the promises of the world's nations under the 2015 Paris Agreement, 
It puts us on a track to stop warming at 2.3 degrees Celsius. But there's a different difference between promises and actual policies. The world's nations actual policies and investments in fossil fuel energy show that we're on track to warm nearly three degrees Celsius. This represents a gap uh, between promises and actual investments. And every year, the United Nations comes out with what's known as the gap report, telling us in detail about this problem. The gap report for 2023 came out in early December. And it tells us that greenhouse gas emissions need to be cut by 28% in the next five and a half years to keep within two degrees Celsius. And based on current commitments, emissions will only be cut 2%. Net zero pledges of the world's nations cover about 80% of emissions, but most of them, when analyzed, are hollow and lack implementing mechanisms. Limiting warming, warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius would require global emissions reductions of 9% per year. And if you'll recall, even during the COVID pandemic, we, will only, we were only able to cut emissions 5.4%. Globally, governments still plan to produce more than double the amount of fossil fuels in 2030 than would be consistent with stopping warming at 2 degrees Celsius. This graph came out from the rhodium group. It shows that emissions are projected to peak potentially this year or next year, and then go into a long plateau, a gentle slide, only being reduced a few percent by 2050, and perhaps rising again by the end of the century. These projections put us on a pathway of about three degrees Celsius. The good news is that after 200 years of fossil fuel expansion, we are at a turning point in the global energy system. Global renewable energy grew by 50% last year in 2023. This is the fastest in two decades. By 2028, renewable energy will account for over 42% of global electricity generation. In 2020, one in 25 cars sold were electric, and last year, one in five cars sold were electric. Global energy demand growth will now almost entirely be met by renewables, according to the International Energy Agency. And economic growth no longer requires rising emissions. This is a re remarkable accomplishment, but ambition needs to accelerate. Oil and gas production continue to increase and we are headed for a long plateau of continued emissions. Globally and here in Hawaii, we are engaged in a sustainability transition. We are focused on cutting carbon emissions because that is what is needed immediately and over the long term in order to stop global warming. This is called mitigation. And because there are climate hazards that have already been triggered by the warming, we have created, we must engage in adaptation. Doing this through a social equity lens, that is putting people first, especially underrepresented and underserved communities, and engaging in mitigation and adaptation simultaneously is called climate resilient development. This term is proposed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their assessment report number six. We cannot focus just on mitigation and just on adaptation. We must do all of the above, and we must take care of our underserved communities first. Doing this involves recognizing and investing in public health, investing in affordable housing, investing in education, investing in water resource management, stopping our overconsumption, tracking disease, which is growing in prevalence, stopping biodiversity loss, and stopping economic trade 
that is not consistent with ecological preservation and stopping pollution. It's important that we not get carbon tunnel vision. Yes, we must stop our emissions, but we have all these other jobs to do at the same time. This is what a true sustainability transition would entail. Regarding sea level rise, the recent report from the IPCC said that sea level is committed to rise for centuries to millennia. This is due to continuing deep ocean warming and ice sheet melt and will remain elevated for thousands of years. They have high confidence in this statement. In other words, sea level rise is an unstoppable reality. It is accelerating and our laws and policies must keep up. How high will sea level rise? From this, there is uh, information from a federal task force that provided sea level planning scenarios for every tide gauge in the US. This is the set of planning scenarios for the Honolulu tide gauge. These lowest two scenarios, called the low and intermediate low scenarios, would require that sea level rise slow down. So they are no longer viable. The intermediate scenario would have sea level rising four feet by 2100, and the intermediate high scenario about six feet by the end of the century. These scenarios give guidelines for every decade all the way through 2150 so that we can plan the elevation of building renovations, new roads, moving roads, all sorts of changes to our coastal communities so that we can avoid flooding. Which of these scenarios do we pick? That depends on the, on the sensitivity of the project. If you were to build a nuclear power plant in the coastal zone, you'd want to pick the high scenario because you can't afford to get it wrong. That's an example. Our group at the university has been modeling many of the impacts related to sea level rise. This is the community of Eva Beach, which shows the annual high wave run up under one foot of sea level rise, which is projected to occur around mid-century. At this scale, it only shows the front of the beachfront houses getting hit by wave run-up. Here we are with two to three feet of sea level rise. Every summer then, this would be the high surf. This is not a hurricane. This is our typical swell where you grab your surfboard and go up and catch the swell. You can see the run-up by 2075 punches in a block or more through Eva Beach. And we are projected to reach four feet of sea level rise. So by the end of the century, we're looking at the entire Eva Beach community every summer being inundated by waves. We also have coastal erosion. Uh, these green lines represent where our models are applied every 66 feet along the shore or 20 meters. Here is the erosion uh, model line for one foot of sea level rise, two, three, and this would be by the end of the century, we see hundreds of homes and miles of roadway threatened by erosion under four feet of sea level rise. We also know that as sea level rises, the water table under our buildings and homes and roads will rise. So follow the red line, sea level rises. And of course, we get wave and tidal flooding over the shoreline. But this boundary between freshwater and saltwater under the ground also rises pushing the water table up, leading to groundwater inundation. We already see this happening at high tide, and this is our scientist, Dr. Shelley Habel, measuring the salinity and finding near ocean water salinity um, in the foundation uh, of one of the hotels in Waikiki. We also know that there is World War II pollution floating on the water table, especially in the Ivalet area. So sea level rise will bring polluted groundwater to the surface, not only this World War II pollution, but all of the cesspools uh, and leaky underground uh, storage tanks, as well as the uh, main force uh, lines for sewage delivery. 
We already see at high tide flooding coming out of our gravity-fed storm drain system. This means that at high tide, the very foundation of our drainage system, which is gravity, is no longer in play. Gravity drainage no longer works in Waikiki, in huge parts of Kaka'ako, and in many parts of our coastal communities. Miami Beach has recognized this, and they have already started putting pumped drainage in place, where they rescape a block so that when it rains, the water flows towards a pump. Uh, that water is partially cleaned and then pumped into Biscayne Bay. And of course, when it rains, we have what's known as compound flooding. And here we are in the summertime. During the summertime, our highest high tide of the day occurs at the end of the day when everybody's trying to leave Waikiki to hit the H1 and go home. If it rains then, you have high tide, the water table is high, the storm drains are filled with salt water, there's no place for the rain to go, and you break up families for hours. Often they don't get together again until midnight or so. So this is an example of a rain that, uh, a Kona storm that occurred December 5th in 2021. You can see Waikiki is under about a foot and a half of water. And the only reason those storefronts aren't flooded is because they've been recently redesigned under FEMA guidelines um, so that they are raised slightly uh, above a potential <coughs> flood, a flood layer. And with that, I will end and thank you very much. Uh, question, uh, for, uh, Dr. Fletcher. Yes, sir. Uh, any bright spots in the global effort? <laughs> A lot of bad news there, but uh, against climate change? Yeah, the bright spots are that all the key f factors are aware of the problem. Really, it boils down to the fact that if you, you know, we need trillions of dollars to invest in clean energy. But if you're an investor, you still make more return through oil and gas. We need clean energy to give the same return that oil and gas does. Uh, a lot of great things have been accomplished. We no longer need to increase emissions in order to engage in development. We have lots of renewable forms of uh, development. Uh, but it, it can't all ride on the backs of the government. We need the governments of the world to be more honest about their promises, and we need the investment community where most of the money actually resides, uh, the investors to get more return for their investment or for them to be more angelic in their investment decisions. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Uh, just a few. Sure. Um, yeah, that was a great presentation. I felt like it really kind of summed up the gravity um, especially with the news this past year. And I also, I just appreciate it because you don't see it mentioned very often, the um, points you had on that circle of sustainability that drew in all the other aspects of it, you know, mentioning uh, pollution and overconsumption and things that have maybe been sidelined, the conversations have been sidelined for a number of years while we just focus on emissions mitigation. And yeah. I think those things have ancillary benefits when you reduce solid waste, you're saving space in the landfill, but you're also tackling a consumption issue. Yeah, um, a resilient community is one that pulls together when they're hit by an extreme weather event. And so affordable housing, education for all, um, child care, these create a more coherent community. And so I see all of those actions, which are you know top of mind on today's headlines, as climate resilient actions. They're all important. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, John Provender. Is it Bravender? Revender. Revender. Okay, thank you. He is the warning co coordinator meteorolo meteorologist at the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. Uh, he has in, been in that position since uh, August of 2017. He's been a meteorologist since 1999. He got his Bachelor of Science degree from University of Michigan. John, go blue. Hello, congrats to your Wolverines. Uh, Winning the national championship. My wife graduated from in 69 from UM, and my eardrums are still recovering from all the screaming that was going on. I wasn't even in the same room, but uh, anyway, congrats. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Senator. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm the, the Tokyo, Michigan graduate for several people in Hawaii, so I got lots of <laughs> congratulations texts Good. on Monday. Uh, thanks for having me here, and uh, hopefully we'll have some 
going, going after ship is always very sobering um, to see the, the state of things. And as a meteorologist with the Central Pacific Hurricane Center, I'll take this from more of a, a hurricane aspect for what we do here. To set the, the stage for what we're talking about um, for tropical cyclones, uh, this is looking back uh, several decades, past tracks of tropical depressions in green, tropical storms in yellow, hurricanes in red, and major hurricanes in purple. And it's a, a messy plot. And for those in the back, uh, you, the, the, the key message is the, the uh, lots of clusters in the far eastern Pacific, not so much in the central Pacific. For reference, I'll put a couple things on here. One, Hawaii circled here in the oval for reference of where we are on the map. And then I'll throw another line on here. This is 140 degrees west longitude, which really doesn't matter for anybody except my office. Because east of this line, the National Hurricane Center in Miami handles the forecast, and west of this line is our area in the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. And when I talk about the Central Pacific, it's this area that I, I'll reference between 140 west and the international dateline. For uh, when I talk about an average year for us, we have about four to five tropical cyclones in an average year. Uh, Paushin had mentioned uh, the averages during the El Nino years when it's busy, and the La Nina years when it's quiet, you know, less active. Overall, it's about four to five, four and a half or so. And hopefully it stands out from this map. In the East Pacific, there's a lot more activity. Uh, it tapers off as it gets closer to the state, uh, in part between cooler water, cooler ocean temperatures near us and stronger wind shear over the islands. Uh, there are a lot of tracks south of us, uh, going east to west south of us, but you'll all see some standouts there recurving and passing near us. We'll take a zoom into the islands here. These are all the hurricanes that have passed within 80 miles of Hawaii since 1950. Um, noted on here are some of the more impactful ones. Uh, we, we talked about several of these already. Uh, uh, Iniki was our first billion dollar disaster. Uh, we have since had our second last, last year with Lahaina. Um, 26 fatalities all told. Um, I break down some of those uh, somewhere at sea, some due to high surf, uh, others uh, flying debris, a house collapse, electrocution. There's been a, a, a variety of causes for the hurricane related, tropical cyclone related fatalities. Some of these actually are from impactful landfalling storms. For example, Lane didn't make landfall. We had one drowning fatality of a hiker trying to cross a stream. Uh, in 2016, we had two. Uh, drowning fatalities due to high surf from Tropical Storm Celia, which was still in the Eastern Pacific. So we can have hazards far away from, from tropical cyclones. And this, the, the, the map on the left shows the hurricanes near us. And if I step forward here, add the tropical storms and then tropical depressions as well. And we have a, a fair number of tropical cyclones passing near us. The tropical depressions usually as remnants bring in a lot of heavy rainfall. Not, not the wind associated with them, but still damaging impacts from the rain. And uh, an average year for us is four to five, and I'll give you a flashback to 2015. This is the com a record setting year of 16 tropical cyclones that year. An average is four to five. This was, it blew those out of the water. Uh, when, when you talk to meteorologists, if, if you're unfortunate to have enough and fortunate enough to have friends that are meteorologists who know that we are a strange sort that remember weather events to a crazy degree. Uh, what, what dates? March 9th, 2012, the record setting hail, um, everything like that. It's, 2015 is a blur to me. Um, it was so busy, uh, it, it, it all blends together. This composite is a satellite image from every day. Our hydrologist, Kevin Kodama, put this together. Um, did compose a small target in a big ocean. Uh, We've only had a handful of direct impacts, and that's just luck so far. Um, we, we had Eva in 82, Aniki in 92. Before that, it had been uh, Dot in 1959, um, as, as far as an impactful hurricane before that. So it's rare, but when it does happen, it, the impacts can be catastrophic. Now, looking at the 2015 year, um, as, as was mentioned, it's, this was a, a strong El Nino year. This is the, the map on the left uh, is the whole Pacific, North America on the right, Australia in the lower left. Hawaii circled in blue there, so you can see a reference. And the 
yellows to orange to red colors are above normal ocean temperatures across the whole Pacific. Uh, we, we define El Nino right along the equator. We're in El Nino right now. It's not the same type of event as, event as this. Uh, temperatures near Hawaii and to the east of the state are cooler than normal. We didn't have as active of a year as we were expecting this past year. Uh, we had four tropical cyclones during this past hurricane season. If, uh, if the temperature, well, ocean temperatures east of the state were a little warmer than they were before, we might have had two more. Um, uh, two of them weekend right about 130 degrees west didn't move into the basin. If it was an event like this, we could have been above normal. <laughs> but what I want to mention with this, above normal ocean temperatures average uh, two, two and a half degrees above normal. And we ended up with a very busy hurricane season. The image on the right is a composite wind field of in orange tropical storm force winds and in red hurricane force winds. Uh, hurricane hur hurricanes uh, passing north of the state, um, north of north of 30 degrees north. 2015 was a, a transpac year, and talking to some of the sailors around the harbor, delivering boats back to California, they said they've never seen water temperatures that warm going that far north in the decades they'd been sailing around here. And we were just lucky where we the placement was. If that cluster of tracks was shifted 10 degrees west, we would have had four hurricane impacts across the state. It just so happened that it set up far enough east. It, uh, we were, like I said, we were very lucky with that season. So what does that mean going forward? Um, I, I grabbed a couple, we'll reference a couple papers here just for a way to better visualize some of the impacts. Uh, this one looks at three decades worth of hurricane tracks and how they've changed with time. This seen, uh, already have seen a northward trend in the northern hemisphere, southward trend in the southern hemisphere. So all those tracks passing south of the state uh, would be at a little higher latitude. So maybe instead of a, a hectare in 2018 passing well south of the state, you end up with like Calvin passing south of the Big Island, bringing us some rainfall, or, for example, Douglas passing north of us. Uh, this other model uh, simulation looks at uh, future projections, and two components here. For a lot of most of our activity in the Central Pacific comes from the Eastern Pacific Basin, so where those form in the East Pacific, uh, it looks like that Genesis area where they develop is shifted northward. Uh, putting us more in the crosshairs as they move westward. And then also the environment around Hawaii, uh, what we normally rely on to you know, cause the tropical cyclones to weaken on average, cooler ocean temperatures, stronger wind shear, drier air, those decreasing not as unfavorable for hurricanes causing them to weaken. So increasing the threat from both of those. But one thing I want to emphasize is that it's not necessarily a future problem. This is something that we have to look at right now. And this chart is, it covers hurricane season. It's the number of days with an active tropical cyclone, uh, red hurricane, yellow tropical storm, green tropical depression, um, showing the peak in August into September. And we've highlighted some of the more impactful hurricanes that we have on here. Uh, we haven't updated this with the, the data from 2023 yet, but uh, Dora passing south of the state on August 8th was the same day Isel made landfall uh, on the Big Island in 2014. So that's where that falls in the, in the chart. One thing I want to point out about this is that it's not a normal distribution up and down. It's a little longer onto the, the later side in the year. Um, at, during El Nino years, we tend to have more active hurricane seasons. We also tend to have longer hurricane seasons, in part because of warmer ocean waters. So as warm, wa ocean waters get warmer, they, um, we can have uh, con activity continue longer into the year. And that's one thing that we're worried about as temperatures rise globally. Uh, a longer window for impact, pushing our chances for uh, some sort of direct impact throughout hurricane season. <coughs> now, Senator Ed had asked uh, me to talk a little bit about the, the Saffir-Simpson scale as well to give an idea. We, we talk about uh, the, the different categories for hurricane. Um, 
these are some examples from the Central Pacific Basin. Uh, it, you know, the, the Sapphire Simpson scale might be a little, little, little dry, hard to remember. So when you talk about Cat 1, Cat 2, Cat 3, Cat 4, um, hopefully this will make a little um, better uh, brain connection for that. But we have had a whole variety of them in the Central Pacific. Uh, lane 2018, Category 5, a lot of our planning has been only Category 1 through 4. And Yiki was a 4. Uh, some of our modeling we've done has only been through Category 4. Like, oh, well, for the Central Pacific, we don't have to worry about Category 5. Um, Eoki in 2006 was the last one that we had had. And then 2018, we had both Lane and Wolaka reach the maximum Category 5 strength. Uh, Wolaka was the one that moved through the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and um, essentially de destroyed East Island and French Frigate Shoals. So that, that, that's going to be a, a, a theme that I want to talk about, too, of what has happened and what could happen in the future and what we focus on for our preparedness. This is a, a, a lot of descriptions for each of these categories. Uh, we, we, I put these in the slides so you'd have them as a reference in the future um, to take a look at these. The idea being that as the, the, the hurricane strength increases, there's a lot more damage. And the important thing to remember about wind speeds is that it's not a linear increase. Uh, if you double the wind speed, you don't double the damage. It's actually a... Um, factor of you know, power of eight. So a, a doubling increase creates a, a 256 time increase in the amount of damage. And that's what we have broken down here. Every five mile an hour increase in wind speed, how much more damaging the winds are compared to a 75 mile an hour hurricane. So um, you have a 75 mile an hour hurricane, if that ends up being 85 miles an hour, that can cause almost three, three times as much damage just because of the stronger wind field. Uh, so that can be make preparations for these significant events can, can be very difficult. So what can we do? Um, I, I always like to use Hawaii examples in my presentations, but this uh, photograph from Hurricane Ike in Texas is so iconic, it really drives home the point. Uh, this was a, uh, these the folks had a house that was destroyed during Hurricane Rita in 2005, and they rebuilt it. And when Ike made landfall, it was the only house standing. And the quote from the Houston Chronicle here really says it all. Um, the building code was forced, it had, it had to withstand 130 mile an hour winds. Um, he even talked about building it higher than needed. Uh, he wanted to break in his flood insurance, so he built it higher than it needed to be. It's hard to tell from this picture, but the house is actually elevated. It's 15 feet off the ground. So these are actions that they were able to take. They, they unfortunately had to have a home destroyed first, but when they built it back, they planned for the next impactful hurricane. And that's where we come into play. We, this is the sort of thing that we can help um, mitigate these issues. And when we, we plan for these possible conditions, uh, the two things we have to worry about are is, um, one, planning for those events that have happened in the past that not planning for what it could be in the future. We've seen lots of instances where, like, oh, we, we've, we've never had 49 inches of rain in 24 hours. And, oh, wait, that happened 2018 on Kauai and washed out Kuhio Highway and isolated the North Shore for months. Or um, we, we don't plan for a, a Category 5 hurricane in the Central Pacific. And, oh, yeah, a lane was 300 miles south of Hawaii when it was Category 5 strength. Um, the, the, we have wildfires, but we never pl planned for them to impact a town, and that happened last summer in Lahaina. Um, th this, even, th this is a, a problem with, with, with worldwide. Um, take the, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. Um, the Fukushima nuclear plant was planned for, okay, this is the strongest earthquake we have to plan for, and Tohoku was stronger than that. So, so going with past history isn't necessarily enough to plan for those future events. And the second item is that we also have a very short history and a short memory. So we talk about 
uh, people forgetting about Aniki. We, 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 you know, we, we start to forget about Eva. Um, uh, 1871, we had a hurricane, a major hurricane hit the Big Island. And uh, linked here in this document is, is a research paper using Hawaiian language newspaper articles and reports in those publications to recreate the track of the Kohala cyclone. And uh, the, the paper conservatively estimates the intensity as a category three impacting the Big Island, moving across the Ko Kohala Mountains, uh, swinging up into Maui, impacting Hana, impacting Lahaina. Uh, so, so the things that you hear, uh, Hawaii Island can never be impacted by a hurricane. Maui can never be impacted by a hurricane. Here's reports from uh, past newspapers showing, yes, it has happened in the past. So it's not just a matter of anticipating things new, it's also remembering what has happened before and planning for those. So that's a little uh, negative, I think. Um, a little more, uh, what can we do now personally? I, I want to plug a, a, a book here, a publica publication from the University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program, Homeowner's Handbook. It's available free. It's linked on the, the slides here. You can also pick up, the, the, you know, Sea Grant has printed this, and it's available for free as well through public libraries across the state. Uh, there's a lot of information in here to help uh, you prepare now. Uh, talking about when your house was built, so what building standards were it built to. Uh, they, they've changed as we've had different disasters. Um, homes built after the mid-90s, after we updated them after Aniki, are more sturdy than those beforehand. And depending on when your house was built, there's actions you can take. Installing hurricane clips, uh, hurry uh, roof tie-downs, continuous load path. There's information in the handbook to help uh, walk you through retrofitting your house to, to protect it now. And then uh, we've been talking a lot about wind with hurricanes, but uh, it's just one of the hazards. Storm surge uh, for coastal areas, uh, when I talk about saltwater runup, or flooding, freshwater flooding. Uh, as we saw in 2018 with Hurricane Lane, um, 58 inches of rain in three days, it's uh, set the state rainfall record, caused flooding where they hadn't had flooding before on Hawaii Island. So those are two things to, to keep in mind as well. And linked here are resources to uh, the, the flood threat maps from FEMA and also the storm surge maps that uh, my agency has created. And you'll notice here, as I mentioned, uh, the highest one we have for Hawaii is a Category 4 because we didn't think to do modeling for Category 5s. Is that an oversight on our part? Absolutely. We didn't think ahead. We were basing it on the past information. And then the other caveat too, uh, I guess to, to make this more sobering as well, as Chip mentioned, all of our rainfall drains into the ocean. So if the sea level is higher, if the storm drains are blocked with ocean water, it's not gonna run off as much, so we'll have more freshwater flooding problems as well. So that's, uh, I'll wrap that up and I guess pause for any questions. Great, thank you, John. Any questions, members? Yeah. Thank you, and um, coming from Lahaina and having lived through what had occurred, you know, it was like, is there a way, because that, was it Dora? What was that hurricane below us 500 miles away, which Dora. didn't even hit us straight on, and look at the effects that caused, supposedly. I mean, is there, was that the cause for those 59 years I've lived in Lahaina, never seen winds like that? Mm -hmm. which, That's, Dora was over 500 miles south of the state, right. and... So that's uh, you're, you're, that's something that is being researched now, and is a big a uh, uh, big topic in the American Meteorological Society. Uh, doing some modeling to f can we take Dora out of the equation and see what winds we've had with that? And I I don't know how much of an impact it played. It was definitely outside the wind field from the hurricane itself, but you have a. Uh, a strong wind field between the subtrop between the high pressure north of us and the hurricane south of us, and then also a lot of sinking air outside of the hurricane. So there's thunderstorms in the middle of the hurricane. That air goes up, and then it comes down outside. And it's that sinking air over Hawaii kept conditions very dry, led to the the, the dry conditions at the surface. Also led to a, a very low and strong in temperature inversion right over the mountain. And those came together, inversion right at the ridge top level, ended up with the strong downslope winds. And that's not something new. 
actually even in Lahaina itself, there was a, a wildfire in 2018 before Hurricane yeah. Lane, no. right? The, um, it, it was a, a, a shock to a lot of people when people evacuated their homes to a, a hurricane refuge shelter ahead of the hurricane and then had to evacuate the hurricane shelter because of the wildfire. Like that um, is, is not something that you, you, you plan for with, with a hurricane. So was it how much of an impact? I don't know. Could it happen again? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And sorry, a follow up. Yeah. And then, I mean, and then there's a tornado the other day. So these are like just, um, you know, anomalies, or are they not going to be anomaly? I guess like a, a occurring, you know, type of thing. And have you folks seen? I don't, you know, the the reports and changes in our climate obviously has some effect. But where are you folks, you know, tra tracking that or charting it or? Actually, that's a, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up too because I, I, I talked about wind, I talked about rain, storm surge. I didn't talk about tornadoes, which is another threat with hurricanes as well. Uh, usually it's the right front quadrant. So when Lane was coming up here from the south, that was what we were worried about as well with the, the, the spin in the atmosphere. The other night with the tornado warning for Molokai, that's uh, a hazard that we get hurricanes during the summertime, but especially with our fronts cold fronts and conal lows and our wet season storms, that tornado hazard is a, a wintertime hazard for us as well. Uh, I mentioned the, the 2012 thunderstorm on Oahu that brought us our record setting hail, four and a, half, four and a quarter inch size hail falling out of this thunder, supercell thunderstorm. We also had a tornado with that. Um, moved a, it was a water spout moved on shore in Lanikai. So we have had tornadoes here. Um, we probably don't know about as many as occur because a lot of these thunderstorms, you can see them on radar, they're offshore. We, we bet there's really density weather with them, but there's nobody under them, thankfully, to, to experience it. And it's a matter of that being a small target in a big ocean. So tornadoes, add that to the list. That's another hazard we have to worry about that exists, isn't well understood, and could potentially be increasing as these conditions get worse in the future. Okay, well, thank you. Don't yes, envy yeah. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Uh, Big Island, uh, landmass of Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, Kualai, Kohalas. Uh, one of the opinions is because of the landmass, we do get a little bit of a high pressure area over the Big Island, which helps fend off some of the larger storms. What's your opinion? So, some of the research I've read on that. Um, Hurricanes are really tall structures. Uh, thunderstorms extending up to, to 50,000 feet, 50 or 60,000 feet in the air. Um, the, the most influence for steering them, how the, the winds, they, and of course they, they, they move with the wind, the most influence to their direction comes from about 20,000 feet to 40,000 <laughs> feet. So that's above the, 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 the mountain top level for Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. So there's a, not a big influence with that directly. Uh, there, there's also been some research from some students at UH. Uh, there is a slight deflection they found in, with some tracks, but not to a degree that Hawaii, Big Island is safe. Uh, it, it won't uh, steer them away or anything like that. Uh, we do know that if something impacts the island, like we saw with Isel in 2014 or Darby in 2016, that once it hits the terrain, it completely disrupts the, the circulation. And uh, in, in the case of Isel, it weakened rapidly after that point, and it was a, a remnant low soon thereafter as it came out the other side. So from that standpoint, um, Big Island could be uh, a deflector or a... Um, protection for the other islands by absorbing the impact, but that doesn't help the residents on the big island. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you very much, John. Cool, thank you. Folks, we're gonna take a uh, five minute break. It's uh, 2.26 now, so we'll start.
now. We are we have Dr. Victoria Keener. She's the senior research uh, fellow at the East West Center. Also the co-lead principal investigator of the Pacific Research on Island Solutions for Adaptation, which is funded by NOAA, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, for those who don't know that. And also she's the author of the fifth national climate assessment released by the White House in November 2023. Okay, so uh, Dr. Keeney. Thank you so much, Senators, Representatives. Um, <coughs> it's great to be here today and really great that there is an opportunity at this scale to really talk about how to link climate change and impacts from the global scale to the regional, to the local, to the impacts we see on our communities and our ecosystems. Um, so it's kind of a, a, it's been a good setup today in terms of order of speakers, um, you know, going from that large scale down to smaller because really what I'm going to be able to talk about today uh, our results from um, our Hawaiian Pacific Islands chapter of the Fifth National Climate Assessment, which uh, Senator Gabbard said was reduced, uh, released by the White House in November of last year, and really concentrates on localizing those impacts on sectors, key <coughs> sectors in Hawaii and the islands that we care about, the impacts on the people and um, communities and ecosystems. Um, so as you can see, I'm one of many authors of this chapter, so it was by no means, um, no means leading it, but one of many. Um, and it's working, there we go. Um, and the National Climate Assessment, um, this is the fifth one that was released by the, uh, by the White House and the federal government. It's mandated by federal law through the 1990 Global Change Research Act to be released every four years. It's a quadrennial report released by the White House um, to really, again, localize those national climate risks. So like the IPCC report is for the world, the national climate assessment is for the US. It's classified as a highly influential scientific assessment, or a HESA, um, which is really a way for the, the federal government to get the most um, up-to-date and um, trusted information about climate impacts in every key sector and every key region in the US. Um, so as, uh, as was said, I was an author on the Hawaii and Pacific Islands chapter. It took over two years to produce. Um, we had five public workshops to shape the key messages therein. There are 16 authors, over uh, 40 technical contributors, and we assessed over 486 references that were then cited in this chapter. Um, but it is very readable, so I encourage everyone to go and uh, click on the, the link down there that links to the National Climate Assessment for 2023. Um, so climate change, as we have heard, in the Pacific Islands and in Hawaii, it exacerbates inequities. It threatens ecosystems, cultural resources, human health, livelihoods, the built environment, and access to food and water at all scales. Uh, it's, threatening many of those things that we care about. And one of the, uh, one of the ways that we've um, visualized it in these, uh, in these figures that you see here are through the indicators, which you've heard a lot about today, this technical variables, things like rainfall changing, temperature going up, and then in the bottom panel, the impacts that people and, and ecosystems see on the ground. So, um, you know, the, the, the carbon dioxide is rising, but on the ground, um, in the impacts, we see more intense and frequent heat waves, new diseases and risks to health, um, increased invasive species and wildfire, things like that. Um, but we also know that future greenhouse gas emissions are heavily going to influence what happens in the Pacific after mid-century. So what we've already done as a species has uh, you know, kind of put us where we are now. But after about mid-century, um, what we are going to do is going to determine um, a lot of what our fate is. Some of the things that we're expecting to see and that you've already heard about, uh, warmer air and sea surface temperatures, more heat extremes, more marine heat waves, increasing, increasing ocean acidification, uh, an increase in frequency and intensity of heavy rainfall events and flooding, a greater proportion of more intense tropical cyclones, continuously rising sea level, increased coastal flooding, and uh, negatively impacted fisheries and aquaculture operations um, through increasing sea surface temperatures, acidification, and degraded coral reefs. 
as we've already heard at a global scale, everything is getting warmer, but in Hawaii specifically, the number of hot days per year has increased dramatically. Uh, the temperature in Hawaii um, statewide has ridden, risen by 0.76 degrees Fahrenheit over the past 100 years, which may not sound dramatic, but if you look at uh, this graph on the upper right, um, that shows the Hawaii annual temperatures uh, from about 1920 to 2020, and anything in a red is above, um, above average temperatures, above climatology, and anything blue is below. So as you can see, as we are going, um, getting more current, we're seeing more and more years that are above that climatological average. We've also seen our average number of hot days increased, while the number of cool nights that we get to experience has decreased over time. This is also true across the entire Pacific Islands region. There's a shift across the Pacific to more extreme and frequent daily heat events. Um, and seven of the warmest eight years on record have occurred since 2007. And every year since 1983 has been above that climatological average from 1961 to 1990. We've already heard about um, rainfall trends, so I won't dwell on this too long. Um, but Hawaii rainfall has been trending downwards during wet and dry seasons for decades, with the period since 2008 being particularly dry. Statistically significant trends are indicated on this figure with black hatching. The sharpest downward trends in rainfall are found on the western part of Hawaii Island, although on other islands significant decreases have occurred in wetter areas as well. Although uncertain, future rainfall projections show continued drying on leeward sides of all islands, with some windward areas becoming wetter. And this is just one example um, of one of the models that we have that shows a projection of potential future rainfall changes. And again, those, um, those red colors indicate drying, and the blue areas uh, are wetter at the end of the century by 2100 under a very high emission scenario. Uh, what we also know is that we need organizations, um, climate boundary organizations, like uh, the ones that I work for, academic ones like uh, CHIPS Climate Resilience Collaborative, nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations, acting as climate boundary groups to transform global science into local implementation. A lot of times, um, as we heard from CHIP, policy concentrates on the mitigation of climate change via reducing greenhouse gases, which is essential. However, mitigation without adaptation to the impacts we'll feel and are already experiencing is short-sighted and will disproportionately harm the populations and ecosystems that have been made the most vulnerable to climate change. We know that climate impacts are being felt now and adaptation is critical. Natural resource managers and communities often need data in different formats and scales, but lack the time and expertise to convert them themselves and do that work. And so these, these climate boundary organizations are really critical in making that, um, that transformation. We also know that new partnership models are meant to, uh, needed to do this between researchers, governments at different scales, businesses, and communities. Um, and that we need more relational, non-transactional, and collaborative approaches to adaptation. So for the National Climate Assessment, uh, our chapter had five key messages. Um, so in many of these examples, these impacts are happening now. They're not predicted to happen in 10 years or in 100 years. Today's briefs are providing a lot of information with better and better scientific models and information, uh, showing how we're decreasing that uncertainty in future projections. Um, but a message I think everybody should hear today is that we do not need more certain scientific information to act now to mitigate and adapt Hawaii's systems to what we're already experiencing and what we know will only get worse in the coming decades. Our five key impacts include, uh, that are covered in the chapter include climate change impairing access to healthy food and water, climate change undermining human health but community strength boosts resilience, Rising sea levels threaten infrastructure and local economies and exacerbate existing inequities. Responses to rising threats may help safeguard tropical ecosystems and biodiversity. And finally, indigenous knowledge systems strengthen island resilience. I'm going to go through each of these impacts briefly. Um, and then at the end, I threw in some, um, some policy points where, um, as this is a legislative body, where it might be most helpful um, to look at how these key impacts can be reflected in legislation. 
So in terms of climate change impairing access to healthy food and water, uh, we know that regional food security is negatively impacted by rising sea temperatures, rising temperatures and sea levels. Uh, we've also observed in Hawaii across the region that rising average nighttime temperatures and extremes are threatening commercial subsistence and cultural foods. We also see spread of invasive pests, which is linked to increased heat and drought. We know that droughts have become longer and more severe, and in Hawaii are the principal cause, cause of crop loss. And finally, that access to healthy food is an issue of environmental and social equity, with areas of lower socioeconomic status often linked to fewer varieties of nutritious food. Um, and now in these green boxes, which are going to pop up on every screen from now on, um, I've tried to identify some of the policy places where these impacts might, uh, might link. So the sea level rise 2022 um, uh, bullet point refers to the sea level rise vulnerability report that was released in 27 by the, uh, 2017 by the state, excuse me, and updated in 2022. Um, so in that, uh, in that report, there's a, there are a great deal of recommendations that are all very relevant, but I've just pulled out some that uh, might be particularly relevant in these cases. So recommendation 1.4 was to balance managed retreat from urban areas with preservation of agricultural and conservation lands. The state decarbonization strategy recommends agricultural best management practices and to consider impacts to frontline and low-income communities. By implementing the Hawaii Green Fee, we could reinvest in local food security planning, support groundwater, and streamflow monitoring. And in the prior session, uh, specifically the Senate Bill 420, which supported establishing sustainable food systems working group within Department of Agriculture, could help uh, look at some of these sustainable food options. Next, on climate change undermining human health, um, this, is a, um, this is a figure from the National Climate Assessment um, that looks at uh, an Oahu community heat assessment that was done by the city and a, a cadre of volunteers, community volunteers, and it was done on August 31st, 2019. Um, and what they were able to do was map the afternoon heat index um, all over the urban core and around the coastline of Oahu. And this is just an example of how we're experiencing um, extreme heat related to climate change. We know that um, climate change is increasing the frequency, intensity, and duration of heat extremes. On this afternoon that's mapped here, the maximum recorded heat index was 107.3 degrees Fahrenheit. We also uh, know that 82% of heat-related deaths in Honolulu are already attributable to climate change. We also see an increase across the region of vector-borne diseases such as malaria and dengue. Uh, which are spread by mosquitoes and have been linked to drought and flood cycles, and we expect that to increase further. In terms of how this links to um, uh, policy actions in the 22 uh, sea level rise report, um, Action 2.6 looks at protecting human health via implementing flood design standards. Um, recommendation 6.1 supports the Department of Health to develop criteria for identification of contaminated sites that are high risk of causing harm to, due to rising sea level and flooding. Um, they also support a One Health framework and conversion of cesspools. These are all things that relate to climate change undermining human health. The de decarbonization strategy prioritizes minimizing health impacts to frontline low and low income communities. And in the prior session, the Climate Special Impact Fund would have provided, um, potentially provided funding for all of these initiatives. Key message three was rising sea levels threaten infrastructure and local economies and exacerbate inequities. Uh, we know, we've heard from um, Chip and everyone, that sea level rise is increasingly going to impact coastal infrastructure, transportation, ecosystems, and communities that are vulnerable. These are only going to exacerbate existing social challenges by disrupting livelihoods, especially in vulnerable communities and areas. Uh, Hawaii has enacted very forward-looking state and county policies for sea level rise, one of the leaders in the nation. Um, these include increased minimum setbacks for coastal development, um, looking at future sea level rise within those setbacks, putting the mandate to disclose sea level rise hazards prior to real estate uh, transactions, which was um, huge, and a requirement for state agencies to assess and plan for sea level rise impacts but there is always more that can be done, and those are outlined in that sea level rise 22 report. 
Uh, we also know that degradation of coral reefs due to a rise in those sea surface temperatures could incur uh, additional coastal damages, costing approximately $1.2 billion in 2022 dollars annually to the economies of Hawaii and U.S. Pacific territories. So there is a lot of um, economic savings involved in uh, uh, protecting natural ecosystems as well. In terms of policies that are relevant, in the sea level rise uh, report, seek opportunities to plan new development outside of the um, sea level rise exposure area under long-term comprehensive managed retreat strategy, develop pre-disaster recovery frameworks at state to county levels that include sea level rise, and again, cesspool conversion. Uh, with the green fee, reinvest in supporting sea level rise strategy recommendations. And from the prior uh, session, again, the Climate Impact Special Fund, erosion rate disclosures, tax credit for wind-related retrofits, and rebates for uh, EV-ready um, infrastructure at affordable housing, and the DLNR Manager Retreat Program are all things that could have been relevant. In terms of ecosystem and biodiversity, um, we know that fisheries and aquacultures will be negatively impacted by increasing sea surface temperatures, acidification, and degraded coral reefs. Um, this also this results in reduced commercial and subsistence catch, smaller fish sizes, and degraded reefs. Uh, we also see that increased drought is going to accelerate that contraction of ranges of endemic and endangered plants and animals in the islands. Um, and we have seen through examples that regional efforts and in Hawaii efforts that increasingly focus on restoration management that enhance climate resilience, um, you get a double win for, for that type of adaptation. You're boosting ad adaptive capacity. You have hydrological benefits such as aquifer recharge, sociocultural benefits, carbon sequestration, and sediment retention. Um, I wanted to put one more, uh, one more figure from the chapter uh, up that, that looks at wildfire area burned in the Pacific Islands compared to the Western US. Um, so this is relevant because wildfire area burned has increased fourfold from the early 1900s in Hawaii and is most prevalent in non-native grasslands and shrublands, which we saw in Lahaina recently. Uh, we also know that climatic shifts are expected to impact native ecosystems negatively via interactions with fire. And as shown in this figure, wildland fires already burn a higher proportion of total land area in the Pacific Islands than in the continental US. So in terms of policies, the sea level rise report um, looks at exploring legislative and policy mechanisms to designate funding for priority coastal lands, enabling uh, existing programs to acquire beaches and lands for recreational, cultural, ecosystem, and resilience objectives. Um, other, uh, other relevant policies can include supporting watershed-based restoration, the Hawaii Watershed Partnerships Program, wildfire management, and additional human resources on all of those. Um, in the prior session, the Climate Impact Special Fund and the Carbon Fee are both relevant to this. Finally, we saw through repeated examples uh, across the region that indigenous knowledge systems strengthen island resilience. Climate change affects the health, well-being, and modern livelihoods of Pacific Islands peoples. Um, and climate is already, uh, you know, one of the ways that they're being impacted is affecting cultural sites that show that heritage of interconnectedness of the environment um, with Pacific peoples across the region. Uh, we have examples of communities and cultural practitioners working with scientists to identify area where food production, such as taro, breadfruit, and sweet potato, could be expanded under future climate scenarios. And adaptation actions, such as community-based subsistence projects that restore ecosystem services and enhance community resilience, um, they also have the, the, uh, the other benefits of increasing local food production and diversifying the local economy. Um, so in terms of um, policies, conserving and adapting Native Hawaiian cultural resources and site, working with Native Hawaiian communities to develop culturally-based adaptation processes, um, adaptation to preserve access to coastal lands and waters within Native Hawaiian communities, um, support community-led adaptation projects, support watershed-based protection and restoration, um, and this could all be funded through a climate impact special fund. So finally, I wanted to end with just a um, kind of a um, overall um, plea that a lot of times we hear that Hawaii is too small to make a difference on a lot of these climate change impacts, both mitigation and adaptation. 
but local policies can accelerate regional resilience by repl replication across sectors and across islands. Uh, we know that at higher warming levels, we're going to in in experience more severe climate impacts, but local interventions can mitigate some amount of climate risk. Um, and by including local organizations and communities as partners to co-develop these plans, we're increasing our adaptation and resilience as well. Uh, we already have future scenarios of climate change to provide a range to plan for, depending on a system's risk tolerance that can be really used at a state level to prioritize actions. We have worst case scenarios and best case scenarios that can identify uh, high risk investments and minimum adaptation requirements. Uh, we want to prioritize partnerships that integrate and prioritize cultural knowledge and natural resource management. And finally, um, you know, as part of this learning, we want to promote peer exchange. What are adaptation strategies that are transferable across sectors and across islands, not just within Hawaii, but across the region and across the globe? And with that, um, here's a citation to the chapter if you're interested in diving into more exciting findings that weren't covered here today. Um, you can contact me anytime. There's a chapter webinar by all of the authors. It's going to be on February 13th, um, and that'll be recorded. You can register here. And um, there will be a White House release event for the chapter here in Honolulu at Hawaii Climate Week on March 27th. More info on that soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. King. Member Green. Any questions, Yeah, look at that one. Yeah, um, thank you informative question you talked about acidification of the oceans is that because of carbon dioxide is that what you're yes okay and is that cyclic or is it trending what's what's happening there uh, so this is outside of my area of expertise but um, it's definitely uh, becoming more acidic over time so a long-term increasing trend um, I don't know if it's cyclic okay um, and I, I just was wondering because we've had a lot of problem with acidic rain because of the volcano. I was just wondering if that's being used part of modeling, looking at the near shore waters or anything. Yeah, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that um, the models that look at acidification do include volcanic um, activity, but um, you know, a lot of this is based on observations and actually you know, from Station Aloha. Up, okay, above thank the you. State as well. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on, our next speaker is uh, Donald Aveao. He's the Executive Officer of Hawaii Urgency Management Agency, or HEMA. He has, come forward. Aloha, Donald. Donald has nine years of service with the U.S. Air Force and also more than 30 years of experience, including as a senior instructor with the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center at UH. And he became the executive officer of HIEMA in June of last year. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Oh, I should go through a slide. Okay. Oh, okay. Good morning. Um, I mean, good afternoon, rather. Sorry. Uh, it's been quite a long day, so I know for you folks as well. Uh, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of our agency, the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Um, our mission is to help Hawaii, uh, Ohana, prepare for, mitigate against, respond to, and recover from disasters. So um, that's been our main mission and, uh, and, and for, uh, from the founding of the uh, agency. And um, we do have that slide that says uh, the next slide. That kind of also is much like our national FEMA uh, agency, right, preparedness mitigation, response, and recovery. And it's more so uh, highlighted in, uh, in the recent uh, Maui wildfires um, of what we're um, trying to do uh, now and I mean currently and into the future. So, um, and of course, again, uh, our, house, our hearts go out to the survivors of the uh, Maui wildfires and for all of those that are uh, continue to support the operation, uh, first responders, our leadership, um, you know, our legislature and our governor. Um, if I miss anybody, I apologize, but you know, it is a, uh, it's, it's a cockle thing for me, um, you know, and as well as our administrator to, to be where we're at at this time. You know, being with FEMA uh, for all these years, um, I worked there for six years before coming to Hyema, and I understand uh, the timelines that these <laughs> things take, and we have a far, uh, you know, we've, of accelerated schedule from, uh, with the help of uh, FEMA, and of course the president, and of course the governor. Um, and the mayors of our counties um, 
you know, they've all worked together. And I appreciate the legislature, uh, legislators uh, and their efforts in helping this, uh, you know, which will, you know, in this uh, Maui wildfire disasters as well as future disasters that may uh, impact uh, on a statewide, um, um, you know, a scenario. So um, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that never happens, but um, you know, just seeing how everybody's working together and coordinating, you know, not everybody may be happy. And like my wife always tells me, you're not gonna make everybody happy, but it's good. It's, it's part of the process. So, you know, we're gonna work it out and of course, uh, you got to make her happy, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> just, just. <laughs> so I just wanted to add uh, also, uh, Haima, our core values, and part of what I've just said is to, uh, we do have five that we always, um, you know, try to remind ourselves and our, our personnel, and then for our federal partners, uh, is to Malama, to care for and protect, uh, Po'okela, striving to undertake every action with excellence and ensuring continuous improvement. Uh, Vivo Ole, which also means courage, but serving the people of Hawaii with courage and fearlessness. Uh, Kupono, to be honest, fair and transparent and open. And of course, uh, the biggest thing that's been part of this whole uh, process uh, is Laulima, to cooperate and work su successfully with others. Um, <clears throat> so we, if we go to the next slide, um, just kind of our structure uh, is the Office of the Governor on the top, and then uh, the overall department is Hawaii State Department of Defense. And then our Director of Emergency Management is, of course, you're all familiar with the, the Adjutant General, Major General uh, Ken Asahara. Uh, he is our main director. And then we have the Deputy Adjutant General. And then we have the six divisions, but now five, because the Office of uh, Homeland Security uh, has transferred over to the Department of Law Enforcement. Mm -hmm. So our other five agencies, of course, uh, besides ourselves, is the Army. Hawaii Army National Guard, Hawaii Air National Guard, uh, Office of the Veteran Services, and of course, the uh, Youth Challenge Program. So. And then finally, our, uh, more of our specific being our, our HAIMA agency. Again, it's the director is our, uh, the TAG, or the Adjutant General, uh, HARA. And then um, James Barros is our administrator. And then myself as the uh, executive officer and then FEMA falls into that uh, also in helping us as our federal partners. We do have five uh, separate current um, uh, operational divisions or branches, uh, which is our, our operations or logistics, resilience branch, finance and administration, and external affairs, which have been very heavily tasked uh, um, being a small agency uh, with our current uh, disaster. So, um, and then along with our, our our county partners, uh, Elton Lucio with Kauai County, uh, Hirokazu Poya for the city and county of Honolulu, uh, Amos, who just got appointed, Lono Kailua Hewitt uh, for Maui County, and Talmadge Magno from Hawaii County. So that's pretty much uh, uh, our layout of our agency, as well as um, some of the things that you may not have known about um, the other uh, partners that we have within our uh, emergency management field. So um, from there, I'm passing it over, over to our State Hazard Mitigation Officer, uh, Kelsey Yamanaka. Thanks, John. And mahalo <coughs> to Chair Gabbard and Chair Lowen for having us today. Climate change is exacerbating the impacts of hazards that we know we're vulnerable to today. Oh, sure. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. So climate change is exacerbating the impacts that of the hazards that we know we're vulnerable to today. And that's why hazard mitigation is so important. Hazard mitigation is reducing or eliminating the long-term risk to life and property from hazards. So I'd like to talk to you about some hazard mitigation opportunities that are coming up. First off, the slide um, shows the governor's hazard mitigation strategy. So this is his overall strategy. The state is committed to executing priority projects identified in mitigation and recovery plans. We don't have to start from scratch. We have existing projects that have been identified as um, being mitigative, um, and we need to help fund those. So we're here today to talk about one funding opportunity. The state is also encouraging projects that mitigate against multiple hazards and incorporate nature-based solutions like coral restoration and incorporating emerging technologies. And of course, we also want to encourage projects that reduce the community's long-term vulnerability to natural hazards. 
The recent wildfires unlocked FEMA's hazard mitigation grant program, and that's the funding opportunity I'm here to talk about today. The governor released his funding priorities for this hazard mitigation or HMGP grant program. And I won't list all six, uh, but just to touch on a few, we want to strengthen resilience for critical facilities and critical infrastructure. We want to benefit the underserved and underrepresented communities. And we also want to prioritize projects that will benefit the areas in the declared disaster. And the copy of the governor's funding priorities and funding mitigation, excuse me, the mitigation strategy can be found on HIEMA's Hazard Mitigation Grant website. Next up is our Hazard Mitigation Program timeline. So as you can see, we're just in the beginning. We've received FEMA's 30-day funding estimate. We've posted our notices of intent over collecting project proposals. We've released the state's priorities, and now we're waiting for FEMA's six-month funding estimate. And this estimate is based off of FEMA's public assistance and individual assistance programs, and that is focused on recovery. I'd also want to mention that there is a non-federal match required for the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Right now, it's at a 75 federal and 25 non-federal cost share. So every project that comes in, the community or the county, state, or uh, private nonprofits that apply, they do have to put a 25% cost share into that project. And with that, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Ethan Oki, to talk about HIEMA's community outreach initiatives. Thank you, Chair, um, Chair Lauren and Chair Gabbard. Um, just to clarify, um, I'm actually stepping in for our community outreach person, um, John Vieira. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to attend today due to some me meetings that he needed to attend in Maui in regards to our long-term housing um, efforts. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to continue on with the slide. Next slide. So overall, for our co community outreach, our priorities is to strengthen our partnerships, whether that partnerships deal with our federal, our state, or our county partners. We, we want to make sure with this time <coughs> administration that you know, we're working together, right? They all have their facets, their subject matter expertise. Our, uh, our goal is to strengthen that uh, as a CACO kind of perspective. Like we're all doing it together because it's going to impact all of us as one. Um, we're going to develop those relationships with our partners. We're going to build community resilient hubs, strengthen and align operation plans, and then also we're going to revamp what existing HARP program that we have. We're kind of uh, rebranding it with HARP uh, 2.0, which in the next slide, um, uh, the goals uh, for the HARP is to en enhance the resilience for our, our communities, promote and understand multiple hazard and actions to be taken, leverage leading resources, best practices for disaster mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery, and tap into cutting edge, cutting edge tools to protect ourselves, our families, and our loved ones. Um, so we have a handout um, that we're going to email all of you and follow up to this, um, to this info, informational briefing um, that kind of goes over that. And ideally, the administrator's goal is to uh, identify what existing HRs we have and then also build up from there. Uh, the goal is to have 10 uh, statewide HRs um, fully functional that are going to partner with not only the state but as well as the counties. Um, in regards to any emergency management um, situations. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to um, our expert. Okay. Thank you, Ethan. And oh, oh, Kelsey, appreciate the uh, information. Um, yeah, we, you know, the HR program is to empower those communities, to, um, you know, uh, statewide to um, you know, be re uh, resilient and be able to uh, respond and recover from a disaster. So. Um, by doing so, that you know the community will 
it, it's a lot easier to have the community members that are identify with each other, that already have networked with each other, um, you know, some, find out their strengths and weaknesses uh, a lot quicker. And, um, you know, of course, like I said uh, earlier, it's a cockle thing, and everyone, everyone wants to benefit and uh, work together um, in trying to get back to normalcy. Um, in closing, uh, I, you know, for ourselves, um, uh, as our Kelsey had mentioned, uh, we do want you to support Governor Green's uh, climate change mitigation proposals. Uh, it will provide um, needed monies for projects such as uh, fire breaks and, of course, evacuation route access road improvements. Um, you know, in previous uh, informational briefings, we, the evacuation routes was brought up, and it is an important uh, component, especially uh, out in, on your side, Senator Gabbard, on the west side. Um, they are looking at the uh, Hawaiian Homes routes, and of course, um, our uh, logistics uh, chief did um, have um, I had a visit with the Army where they um, brought a group of people to look at the Kole Kole Pass mm -hmm. as one of the evacuation routes as well. Mm -hmm. So that uh, mitigation, uh, climate mitigation proposal, a uh, change proposal will, um, you know, uh, help, help us, uh, you know, improve those roads, uh, have monies to do so, uh, and not so much tap into the state general funds for it, and as well as our CIP budgets, which, you know, everyone else has other needs, uh, including uh, education. Um, and we understand that. And also can be, a, uh, uh, for our counties, our municipal, municipality, sorry, uh, they also provide a match, a local match that we can provide from those fees. Um, and um, a lot of that, um, as I've seen with FEMA, it's difficult for counties. And um, I'm sure you understand being on the council, Maui uh, County Council, that it is difficult for county councils because their budgets are small. And this will help help them, um, you know, raise money to um, have the local match once we do all these projects and as we get it started. Um, of course, Maui, we do have the disaster, but we're talking about statewide. Uh, it will benefit the statewide uh, once we get all this uh, uh, in place. Uh, other than that, if there's any, pending any questions. Uh, okay. Yeah. Members, any questions? Rep. Lauren? Have you, in your list of hazards, do you include heat and extreme temperatures among your list of hazards? We uh, just published our state hazard mitigation plan, and that was started kind of before we had enough information to put that as a listed hazard. So at this time, we do not list it. However, we are touching it at least every year to provide small updates, and then every five years, we will update it, the whole thing. So has it been discussed already within Hyema that that ought to be included as a consideration or a condition that, that there might need emergency response for? Yes, uh, we received some public comments that suggested putting that hazard in this plan, but we just unfortunately didn't have the time since the plan did expire, uh, or it was expiring, so we wanted to ensure that we would be eligible to access some of these FEMA hazard mitigation funds. So yes, we are looking into it and having internal discussions for the next update. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your service. All right, our next speaker will be Tammy Lee, the Deputy Director for Administration for the Hawaii Department of Transportation. Is Tammy here? There she is. She's had many years of service with HDOT, was the Business Management Officer and co Contracting Officer, and she assumed her current role in December of 2022. Thank you, Chair Thanks. Gabbard. <laughs> thank you, Chair Lowen, uh, Senator Richardson, and Representative Cocker, and thank you. Um, I'm Tammy Lee. I'm the Deputy Director for Administration for the Department of Transportation. Um, with me today, I brought a team. Dr. Pradip Pant, he's our Statewide Transportation Planning Office Manager. Uh, Ken Tatsuguchi, he is our Highways Planning Branch Manager and Shelly Kunishige, she is our infrastructure coordinator. Um, but thank you so much for having us today. Um, we were outside listening to all of the presentations, the causes, the impacts, and the emergency preparedness. Um, we're excited to be here. We know that the, at the DOT, our understanding of everybody and all the science that came before us and what is changing, uh, we're focused on making some tough decisions to ensure the long-term viability of our transportation infrastructure. 
The DLT is doing its part to be more resilient, adaptive, and engage in climate change risks to our port and highway networks. Okay, so um, starting with our airports, the 15 airports managed by the DOT are an important driver for Hawaii's economy. 37 million incoming and departing passengers travel through our commercial airports annually. Um, we also have, so 13 of these commercial airports, we have two uh, general aviation exclusive airports as well. Um, to plan for these needed actions, we use um, modeling using the best available data to determine the potential future exposure. From the models, a projected extent of flooding due to sea level rise, called the sea level rise exposure area, um, was studied. Next slide. Thank you. OK, so this slide shows, um, with the red starred, the impacted airports that um, are impacted by the sea level rise. Uh, these preliminary figures uh, were obtained by overlaying the sea level rise exposure area, 3.2 foot flooding layer over the airport area footprint. Um, the accepted sea level rise forecast is that inundation would occur at 10 of our airports. Next slide. So this, it's kind of small, I can't see too much from here, but Basically, what it's showing is that the General Aviation Airport, Port Allen, uh, would be impacted the most with about 29% of its area overlapping the sea, rise, sea level rise exposure area. Uh, more importantly, commercial ports, Kahului Airport and Daniel K. Inoue International Airport would also be significantly impacted at 13% and 9% uh, respectively. There are only five airports, Hilo, Kapalua, Lanai, Moloka'i, and Waimea Kohala airports will not be impacted by this sea level rise model that we did. Based on our preliminary studies, we developed adaptation strategies, um, and the considerations for the airport are to construct shoreline revetment seawalls, <coughs> elevate runways and taxiways, or retrofit facilities. Additionally, retrofit all facilities by reconstruction and modification to at least one foot above the projected sea level rise elevation over the next 100 years. Or to relocate the airports to higher elevations. But currently and in the future, um, to build upon the work that we did for these models for sea level rise is finishing our sea level rise adaptation plan and our climate adaptation action plan. And basically what we're gonna be studying with those plans is to capture all of the potential risks to our airports and not just sea level rise. Um, it would include severe storm events, extreme precipitation and heat, wildfires, tsunamis and lava flows. Next slide. So moving on to our we maintain and operate 10 commercial harbors. Hawaii imports 80% of all of its goods and 98% of that uh, imported food and goods are delivered through the harbor system. The maritime transportation industry is much larger than the air cargo industry when measured by the volume of goods transported. Next slide. <coughs> like the airports, Hawaii harbors are vulnerable to sea level rise. As freeboard or the height of a ship's side between the waterline and the deck decreases due to sea level rise, ports might have to raise structures. Adequate height is important for commercially safe operation of piers as well as maintenance of the pier structure. Substructure erosion and flooding are also of concern to harbors. Our options to address these vulnerabilities are the studies are showing that should there be better drainage or should the decision be made to raise pier heights? And these are the options that we're looking at. Other ports, we've done some studies on other ports and while other ports geographies are so different from Hawaii's, what we can glean from other ports is um, recognizing or maybe mimicking the same approach that they take to make decisions. 
Next slide. This image shows the impacts of the 3.2 foot sea level rise exposure area, flood area on the Honolulu Harbor. As you can see in blue, it's not just the harbor area, but it reaches out to portions of Kalihi Kai and Kalihi Palama. Next slide. The, these are uh, depictions of the sea level rise um, on our other ports. Um, we have to kind of consider the surrounding properties, and that, that's what the takeaway that I wanted to show these, these slides, is for us to consider the surrounding properties um, not under our control and collaborate with those landowners. Next slide. Okay, so as I showed in the first slide, we have differing options. Um, one of them is a sheet pile solution. In 2020, we advertised improvements to our Kapalama terminal yard in 2020. We accepted bids and these figures here are, um, should there be a determination to make improvements to the harbors using sh a sheet pile solution, it would be very expensive. For the KCT project, um, what we did was we used sheet piles to raise the container yard. It was seven feet above sea level. We raised it two more feet to um, nine feet, and it al allows the two feet increase. Um, and basically, it was very expensive. We did a rough order of magnitude to project out to today's numbers, and it would basically cost us about $2.5 billion if we were to decide to go this route. Next slide. OK, so finally, our highways. We um, issued our climate adaptation plan in 2021, and it built on several other studies that we've done, most notably in 2019, our our coastal highway program report. Um, basically, that just focused on the coastal highway, um, but the climate adaptation plan considered a bunch of other stressors, I wanna say eight in total, and it expanded the hazards that we considered in our shoreline study, because we only considered uh, coastal erosion. So it provides more of a comprehensive look at our overall state highway vulnerability to climate hazards. Next slide. So these are just um, examples of our climate exposure on the stressors that we studied in our climate adaptation plan. Um, past and current impacts for landslide and rockfall. These segments are associated with sites that were prioritized in our rockfall protection program and sites determined to have high and very susceptibility according to the United States Geological Survey. So the next picture to the right of that, that's a picture of from DLNR, DLNR of Lahaina. Um, and basically what we wanted to show is that due to the history of many of our roads being belt roads um, meant to connect communities separated by valleys, there are many communities with only one route. Um, for example, we use the emer wildfire emergency proclamation to build um, emergency routes, um, the most, well, Lahaina Luna High School was, was the one that we use most recently. Um, we use the emergency proclamation to quickly construct these emergency routes. Storm surge, this picture is a photo of a storm surge on Kamehameha Highway in Ka'a'awa um, when Hurricane Douglas passed through the islands. Um, that flooding picture to the bottom of the landslide is from June 19's thunderstorm. Coastal erosion, um, that's a picture of early 2020, we implemented a two million fix to protect Kamehameha Highway in Haula and Ka'a'awa when parts of the route were underwater, undermined, excuse me. Additional mitigations we projected at a cost of over 120 million are planned within the next five years. As we know, Madame Pele will tell us when there's going to be a lava flow, but also volcanic eruption studies reveals that rising sea levels 
melting glaciers, depletion of aquifers, and erosion of mountains can all impact the likelihood and frequency of volcanic eruptions. And Eddie would go always, and we're always stoked about big wave action, but it could be detrimental to our infrastructure. Next slide. Okay, so this is more of our climate adaptation plan, and <coughs> what this is showing is we focus on the state highway network um, as the focus of this study. And of the total mileage on the state highway network, 564 miles or 58% of the network are exposed to one or more of the climate change uh, stressors that I talked about earlier. Next slide. So drilling down deeper, you know, I talked about the climate adaptation uh, study, but this came before 2019 where we did a study on our coastal highways and the impacts of uh, coastal erosion. Um, we identified priority state roads for erosion control and shoreline remediation based on this coastal road erosion susceptibility index. Um, this shoreline study looked at 300 discrete coastal highway segments across the state and prioritized them using this new ranking system. Next slide. So this slide is uh, showing that the coastal road erosion susceptibility index top 10 sites, um, six of them on, are on Oahu. Next slide. So some of our strategies for rockfall mitigation include rock scaling, netting, and other systems to catch or deflect rocks. We all remember in 2019 when we had to close the town-bound poly tunnels um, to kind of do or to construct this rock shed system, um, which cost 22 million and took approximately 10 months to construct. Um, to install sim similar protections on all of our sites would cost over 100 million. Next slide. But this is what I wanted to, to, to show at, at the, towards the end of this. And um, in 2020, we partnered with Google and Carto um, to develop this platform called the Climate Insights for Infrastructure. And basically, it's just a more user-friendly um, with overlays of equity, overlays of our assets, such as our bikeways, our pedestrian walkways, um, and overlays of all of the climate stressors that I talked about. So I put the URL on there. Um, we have this GIS map, and the public can go in there and kind of play around with um, all of the different layers. Next slide. And this is our internal tool. Um, beginning in 2019, we developed a, a resiliency policy um, and basically we we want to make sure that internally we, we take care of ourselves I mean we take care uh, internally that we're coordinated to take care of our infrastructure and basically what this um, kind of new query does is that our project managers before they start to do scoping on a project they can take this um, kind of quiz and from there, based on the information, we can do assessments of the most cost-effective design, design and investment responses to start early. And to conclude, moving forward is to build resiliency into our transportation infrastructure. Uh, that means that our system has ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions and to withstand, respond to, and recover rapidly from disruptions disruptions. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Tammy, uh, one question is, when you're talking about the airports, uh, is sea level rise flooding the only concern for the airports? No, it's not. And that's why we're doing that climate adaptation action plan to see what the other stressors are and the impacts to our airport facilities, such as um, wildfires and uh, torrential rains and, and the like. So I, yeah. 
Members, any other questions? Yeah. Senator Richards. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really like the fact that you put some numbers on to the peers. Gives us a idea. Have you come up with any estimates for the highways? Um, as you have a $2.5 billion price tag for our peers, what about the highways? What about the airports? And won't hold you to it yet, but any idea? Okay, for highways, for highways and the sea level rise impacts, 15 billion. What, 15, one five? One five billion. Billion, and airports? For the airports, we're still doing our climate yeah. adaptation plan, and I think from there, um, we're gonna start to do stakeholder involvement going out into the community um, towards the end of fall of 24. So we're not quite there yet, it's something that we're working on. All right, yeah, just, and the reason I ask is just to put it in scale concerning state budget, state GDP, and that's a big bite. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you for the, I saw the numbers for Kahului Airport, because it's our main airport. Um, so I, you mentioned you're gonna have um, stakeholder meetings come end of this year, yes. in the fall. So um, yeah, thank you for that. And I definitely wanna be a part of that. Um, and thank you for the alternate route out of this, you know, basically off Lahaina Luna Road, in particular for the schools up uh, at the top. And has there been discussion though, like a northern route, evacuation route out, out of the schools? Because as we know with the wildfire, Lahaina Luna Road itself had been, right, affected and people got trapped and what have you. So if that occurs again, you know, the people are really, and I live right there off Lahaina Luna Road myself. So, um, you know, a northern route that hopefully you know, my number one CIP ask also is the extension of the northern, you know, the northern route of the bypass itself. So just wondering what you folks um, have comments at this time on that. Any discussion being had about it? Hi. Um, so on the, you mentioned the northern, si the northern side of the bypass. So we are looking on continuing that portion. Um, that That's from an old uh, EIS, so that would probably have to go through e re-evaluation if we move forward with that. But that is being considered based on, you know, what's happened. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, very, yeah, I mean, we're considering it definitely critical infrastructure at this time, life and death situations too. So yeah, I'd like to get that on the priority list. And also I see number two is Maui for the, um, the susceptibility roadway, which it looks like it's the mile marker 14 area, Oluwala Ukumehame. So number two meaning, is that like gonna happen then since it's second on your list of priorities or what, what does that mean? Um, so I ho hope I hope I get this right. So we we're currently in the environmental stage for uh, moving the road Malka from um, basically the tunnel mm -hmm. to um, Olawalu. Um, so so that's I think we're planning to go into design build maybe next year. Um, just to share with everyone, there's moving the road Malka, which will occur with a um, lot of I guess future projects if we move it Malka. There's a lot of environmental issues um, and property owners, so that that's actually um, maybe something I can share. That's you know taking a lot of time in the environmental process. Okay. Well, thanks. We'll be in touch, I guess, on all that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very. Thank you very much. Okay. Next up is Ernie Lau. Ernie is the manager and chief engineer at the Honolulu Board of Water Supply. He was the manager and chief engineer at Kauai Department of Water from 1996 to 2003 and was also the previous deputy director of the State Commission on Water Resource Management. Aloha, Ernie. Aloha. Uh, let me uh, see if I can figure out how to share it here. Uh, 
Uh, if you could bring up my slides, I haven't figured this out. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Er er Ernie Lau, Board of Water Supply. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me today, and it's been very enlightening uh, to get an update on uh, climate change and its uh, impacts. And the, and Dr. Fletcher always scares me. I, I don't know if I can uh, get a sound sleep tonight. I might That's have some nightmares. So. <laughs> but uh, you know, Chip's been great, and and everybody else. Uh, but uh, the reality is sinking home even further. That we thank you. We have to deal with this situation of climate change. And uh, he did point out water resources in his uh, circle of different things or factors, water resources. And, and Ola Ikavai, water is life. Uh, we live in an island, of course, and we all know this, how precious our water resources are. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, next, please. Uh, so we did do an assessment back in 2019, working with the Water Research, uh, Water Research Foundation. They're a national research organization. They provided some of the funding, and using our, our consultant, Brown and Caldwell, look at the assessment of on our water resources and our infrastructure. Next, please. Thank you, and these are the objectives of the study. I won't go over them, but basically, uh, you know, look at the impact of water supply and also coastal system infrastructure, uh, and come up with some strategies to address climate change impacts 2100. Next. Uh, just a reminder, um, we supply almost a million people every day with safe drinking water on the island of Oahu, almost a million people. And we have to produce about 145 million gallons of clean, fresh water, safe drinking water, uh, to meet the needs of our community. And it takes tr a tremendous amount of infrastructure. Next, please. And this is the approach taken during the study, uh, looking at sea level rise, temperature and rainfall impacts, uh, looking at infrastructure adaptations uh, options, also water supply adaptation options. Uh, but I, I can see after the discussion today, and especially when um, John Ravender from the National Weather Service uh, talked about uh, what the future might hold in terms of intense, more intense storms, uh, Category 5 hurricanes, uh, that we also have to uh, take another look at our, the vulnerability of our infrastructure to that very um, threat. Although short term, uh, it can be very significant on our island. Next, please. And of course, you know, Dr. Chu, uh, and the work of the University of Hawaii, and I appreciate the University of Hawaii, uh, the research they're doing, that's very important to our future. The other aspect with the University of Hawaii, if I could say, is also preparing the next generation because the climate change issue is not the challenges of only our generation today. It is going to be for generations to come, even more than seven generations to come to deal with the situation. So. Preparing the future, a uh, future that will be responsible to deal with this. Next, please. And you know, the issue comes down to resource capacity uh, for our island, our freshwater resources. And this is a little dated, it's from 2019, uh, but we looked at uh, two scenarios, dry and wet scenarios, uh, based on the modeling, uh, dynamical downscaling of global climate models, uh, and also taking a statistical approach. Next, please. And between the uh, dry and wet, um, you know, there was a potential reduction of maybe over 130 million gallons a day of freshwater resource capacity, uh, which is going to be very significant. And these are just, uh, some of the actions or uh, mitigation strategies that we are undertaking. Next, please. The other impact, and I appreciate the Department of Health and the uh, Department of Transportation, I misspoke, uh, the DOT, and we work very closely with the DOT because where the state highways are, a lot of times our large pipelines are located, uh, and it's around the island, and particularly along the leeward areas and in the windward areas, uh, we have large transmission pipes moving water around for our community. Uh, and where those highways move or relocate in the future, we will have to go and coordinate with them the relocation of our infrastructure. 
bridges are a vulnerability for us too. Either pipelines go underneath the stream where there's a bridge, or they're hanging on the bridge itself, the bridge structure. So when the bridges get redone, uh, we have to work with the DOT, uh, and they've been great to work with uh, on addressing it, but bridges are a coastal vulnerability for us also, for our infrastructure. Next, please. And inundation, of course. And this is only at 3.2 feet, uh, and Dr. Fletcher probably said we should be looking at much higher levels of sea level rise. Uh, right, Chip? <laughs> but um, the issue is going to be pretty significant, and where this inundation is going to be occurring, it will impact uh, the urban areas. But also remember, under the roadways are a lot of infrastructure gets impacted. Board of water supply, storm drains, sewer systems, underground electrical systems, gas, telecommunications, they're all going to be impacted. So the coordination is going to be very important in how we deal uh, with that uh, uh, so that we coordinate together and we're working with each other as opposed to against each other. Next, please. Uh, and for a lot of our pipelines, there's still metal uh, corrosion uh, issues when they become exposed to seawater, actually inundated in seawater, uh, either partially or uh, all the time. Uh, and how we address the issue of corrosion uh, uh, to, of these pipelines. Next, please. But I also like to point out, and I, I know Chip used this photo too, it's uh, actually this is a water main break we experienced a few years ago on Nimitz Highway near Alakawa, uh, on the road to Costco out there. A uh, 16 inch pipeline on Nimitz Highway. You can see on the left there, the pipe is exposed, but during high tide, the pipe is underwater. Uh, so these become operational challenges. And how to dewater when we're dealing with, uh, in this case, uh, petroleum contamination. That's, you can see that black area on the water, that's, that's fuel. Uh, old fuels that are still there in the environment. And with sea level rise, um, those things will get closer to, to the surface and at, time will, at times will surface on the roadways uh, during these periods. Uh, or our infrastructure will be always underneath them. Uh, so the challenges are operationally, how do we address this? And this is not only for the Board of Water Supply, but with anybody with underground infrastructure. Next, please. One of the things we've done uh, at the city, and, and I, I guess I'm the only city member here uh, working for the city and county of Honolulu is the idea we take a one water approach uh, which looks at water of all different types and uh, we look at collaboration and how we want to work together to address this. So uh, one approach here is actually to use four million dollars in federal grant funds, uh, fiscal recovery funds to actually come up with a one water plan and a collaboration framework so that we can start to coordinate our capital improvement projects and work together. I think that one thing that I, I don't hear a lot of discussion about is these actions to address climate change and the impacts not only to critical infrastructure like ourselves, it's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of investment. And how do we finance these things and still balance that with affordability for our, our for us, it's the water ratepayers, but also for the taxpayers. But it's important that we make these expenditures and how do we do it efficiently and at the, just at the time that we need them to be done? And how do we finance them uh, in the future? I don't know the answer to that yet. But this, uh, using this $4 million, we're going to come up with a plan at the city level uh, to look at how we can collaborate and coordinate better uh, to address uh, some of the, the, these challenges. Next, please. And uh, you know, I just want to say that uh, we have an Office of Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency led by, led by Matt Gonzer. That is a permanent city organization uh, there that looks at this issue full time. And then they help to coordinate uh, the city, different city agencies, including DPP and others, uh, to address these issues. Uh, so uh, I really want to take my hats off to Matt and his team there. Uh, they're developing something called a uh, Climate Ready Oahu Plan that uh, I think is going to be, go before our city council in the near future. Uh, but 
it's also involving the community. So the key is not only understanding the science, uh, the impacts to the uh, utility providers, the infrastructure, uh, the owners of those, uh, but also how do we engage and involve our communities in the solutions because this is going to take, we're going to have to be able to do this together and, and we're going to have to find a way uh, to have difficult conversations and come up with solutions that we all can support and implement and it's going to involve everybody, all our, our community especially. And mahalo, that's all I had to share. Thank you. Thank you Question for you, Ernie, on, uh, you know, with sea level rise, is uh, saltwater intrusion, is that a concern in terms of, uh, with aqu the aquifers? Uh, that is going to be a concern. Uh, you know, we are fortunate in, in uh, portions of Oahu, good portions, we have a cap rock uh, formation that is helping to protect the, uh, the, the freshwater below, but uh, it is not completely, um, it's not complete protection because I think that uh, some of our water sources that are in coastal areas near the coastline, they may start to see impacts there. With sea level rise, uh, saltwater intrusion, but also the other thing that Chip pointed out uh, was the, uh, at, remember our underground aquifers, especially the, uh, the basal aquifers are basically freshwater floating on top of salt water in the volcanic rock below our island. And as that salt water moves up uh, with the rise of sea level, that's going to put pressure to move the freshwater higher to create localized flooding, but also affect the, the aquifer itself. Our wells are fixed points of extraction of fresh water. They're drilled to certain depths. So as the transition between the salt water and the fresh water widens or moves upward, are we going to start to see increased salinity on some of our deeper wells? Uh, so we're, we're going to need to look at that very closely. I just want to uh, say that uh, because of that, we, you know, and, and for other reasons, we are going to embark on our update of our 30-year master plan, our water master plan, which was adopted back in 2016. With all the challenges we see today, it's very appropriate. And one of the focuses is going to be looking at our water resources, uh, how we use the groundwater resources. Uh, we are going to have to prepare for long-term drought. I, I, I don't have a crystal ball to say that will be 100 percent happened to us, but long-term multi-year drought has happened before in Hawaii, uh, and maybe that's going to happen again, uh, and maybe for longer periods of time, maybe even permanently. And how do we adjust, how do we look at how we manage our existing resources, but also look at alternatives. Uh, some of the alternatives is seawater desalination, reuse of wastewater, again taking the one water approach, water of all types, Managing stormwater as a resource, capturing and retaining it for recharge, uh, for reuse. Maybe even someday, you know, uh, reusing uh, wastewater even for drinking, which is what California is actually looking at right now. Uh, I'm not there yet, and it's probably beyond my lifetime, but, uh, uh, but we have to look at all alternatives. Uh, enhancing and protecting our watersheds is going to be critically important, uh, senators and representatives. Uh, because that is the sponge that captures the ua that falls on our island. And if the ua, the amount of ua falling on our watersheds decreases, then we have to make sure the sponge or the watersheds are as efficient and effective as possible to capture whatever limited fresh water is falling on upon them to recharge our re underground aquifers. And I wanna, don't want to leave this out, water conservation. We need to learn how to use less fresh water in our daily lives. Uh, compared to some of the other locations, you know, other states, you know, they are using less per person than we are. And I think we can do better. Living on an island, we have motivation. We can't import water from the Colorado River or another state. We have to live with what we have um, and look at expensive alternatives. So water conservation is part of the story too, managing the demand. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Go ahead. Um, thank you, and thank you for your um, knowledge and background. I can tell you're very passionate. So the preliminary supply adaptation strategies, you kind of hit on the desal and um, 
toilet to tap concept possibly one day. So the um, lettering in blue, is that ongoing or are these um, just recommendations? Uh, uh, can somebody bring back is that, that a, slide? I don't know uh, slide numbers, yeah. there's a number there or something. Hold on, let me bring it up on my iPad here. Okay, I can go down the list. Uh, so aggressive water conservation, dual plumbing with recycled water, and uh, we're actually really a strong proponent for on-site reuse. Uh, so gray water recycling is probably the first step. Stormwater, uh, rainwater catchment systems on, on buildings. Uh, so you're capturing and using the water that falls on the site. Uh, reuse of condensate water from uh, air conditioning systems, all of that reused on-site. Um, uh, maybe uh, showers and uh, shower water, uh, clothes washing, you know, you reuse of that. Uh, we participated in a National Blue Ribbon Committee on a water reuse, and they're looking at all those things uh, across the country. Stormwater capture in Nuuanu, that's an ongoing study that we're doing. Uh, Nuuanu Reservoir Number 4 is a large dam that used to have catfish fishing, and we're looking at can we capture the storms, uh, storms that are shorter duration, high intensity, capture that storm water, don't let it run into the ocean, treat it, and uh, recharge the aquifer. Um, expanded reuse at Honouli, Mil Milanani, Waihawa, and Waimanalo, yes. On-site gray water reuse, I kind of mentioned. Uh, moving water around, um, that's already happening. Addressing the challenges of the public trust rights uh, for domestic water and water for tradition and customary practices. Though that's a challenge that I, don't, I just tell you, I don't have a solution yet, but we have to find a way. Um, Seawater desalination, desalinated reuse, uh, indirect and direct potable reuse of, um, of wastewater. Yeah. So we are working on all of these okay, great. areas. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll just say I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. Thank you. I've I was going to say I might have questions later, but we're tight yeah. on time. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I've, yeah. I've just been informed that we, we have a 415 hard stop, and I want to make sure all of our speakers oh. get an opportunity. Okay. So uh, our next speaker will be uh, Leah Laramie. She's the coordinator of State Climate Change Commission. She was uh, recent, uh, previously a natural resource planner with DOFA. Welcome, Leah. Aloha. Aloha, mahalo Chair Gabbard and Chair Lowe and fellow co-chairs. Thanks everyone for sticking through this whole time. Um, I have been asked to be quick about this, so let's see what we can do. Um, I know we've heard a lot of, of negative, you know, realities that we'll all be facing, but you know, Hawaii is really a leader in climate change action. Um, we have a lot of really amazing goals that have been set um, by the legislature that um, you know we are really working hard towards achieving. Um, this graphic is available at um, climate.hawaii.gov um, if you guys want to look a little bit closer at it. Um, so I'm sharing on, in this presentation some of the really amazing cool things that the state has been doing to address climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. Um, one huge win last legislative session was the legislature allocated $50 million to HGIA for solar plus storage loans for Alice communities, so that's low to middle income um, families. Um, so that they can also um, receive the savings that, that solar um, provides as well as the resilience of, of solar batteries. Um, we also um, work really closely with Hawaii Energy and KOUC to offer rebates for energy efficiency um, on different appliances, lighting, um, and other um, benefits of, of uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, water, water saving efficiency and whatnot. Um, so there's some really great programs here that, that help us with the cost of living in the state. Um, we also have um, electric vehicle charging station rebate program um, and the Hawaii electric bike and moped rebate program, which provides $500 um, with the purchase of new electric bicycles and electric mopeds. These are really great um, because sometimes it's just a little too far to bike around, um, but the e-bikes really make it easier, especially when you live up Malka. Um, we also have the Hawaii Energy, Energy Smart for Homes program, which provides free um, light bulbs and low flow shower heads. Um, in resilience, um, the state building energy efficiency transitions, um, 
and, um, and fleet transitions have been really important in making sure that state buildings are, are being as efficient as possible um, and that we're converting our fleets to um, electric vehicles. Um, we also have established the Carbon Smart Land Management Assistance Program, which provides incentives um, to do climate smart practices on, on agricultural land that includes forestry, um, ranching, and, and farming. 21% um, of our priority watersheds have been protected so far. Um, we set the goal for 30% for of the priority watersheds to be protected by 3030, so we're on track to do that and making great progress. Um, DOT has hired a climate resiliency manager. Um, airports is implementing sea level rise mitigation at Honolulu Airport. Um, there are currently penalties for unauthorized shoreline structures, um, and sea level rise and erosion disclosures are in place. So as people um, you know, sell properties, um, folks are aware of what they're purchasing and, and what the climate impacts may be. Um, we also um, are converting our um, public school bus feet to electric vehicles um, through a $5 million EPA grant. Um, expanding our appliance and equipment standards. This is really important because the more energy efficient we are, the less we really need to rely on increasing our um, energy production. Um, and energy efficiency is just really, really important um, in the general scheme of things, um, as well as updating our energy codes um, a huge win for us was was banning coal for electricity <coughs> generation. Um, that happened in 2022. Um, and to supplement that that energy, we have a multiple um, solar projects and storage projects that have come online since. Um, and there's also, um, at the airports, DOT has worked really hard to get airlines to be able to turn off their engines when they're parked at gates while still being able to cool their airplanes so people are not overheating. So a lot of great innovative things that are happening. Um, also within our Hawaii sea level rise vulnerability um, report from 2022 or update, um, you can see on the right hand side here all of these little bubbles show us the progress that we've made since the 2017 report. So there has been progress, um, there's still a lot to do, um, but we are moving ever closer to the solutions. Um, in equity, um, there's an energy equity hui in the state, which is really looking at how we can balance the shift to renewable energies with the high cost of energy um, as we shift over into um, reducing fossil fuel usage. Um, there's mapping um, at, to identify underserved communities that are going to be at higher risk due to sea level rise and other coastal erosion hazards. Uh, we also, at the Commission, has put together a Climate Social Vulnerability Index. This is um, identifying different data sets that will really help us to identify who's going to be impacted by climate um, impacts and who are going to be the most vulnerable to those because they might not have enough resources to respond to those. Um, and also some great workforce development programs such as Good Jobs Hawaii, which was a $35 million um, grant award for no-cost training and job placement and the Green Jobs Program, which over the past few years has provided $10 million to provide entry-level job opportunities in um, green job areas. Um, the Department of Health has done a lot of work in the health sector. Um, they um, launched their climate and health program, which included a designated person to work on this. There's been a working group put together, a portal. Um, they're doing a study to understand the extent of heat-related illness in Hawaii and also um, a statewide vulnerability assessment of climate and health as well. Um, we've also banned mercury-containing mercury fluorescent lamps, which is really important um, to make sure that mercury doesn't get into our environment. Um, if you want to learn more about all the cool stuff that different departments and counties are doing as well, um, you can check out our Climate Commission annual report, um, which outlines you know, a lot of different specific things that are happening, because that was just a really high-level overview. There's a lot of different things going on, both at the state, county, and, and community levels. So what's next? Now that we've done these things, what are we going to keep on doing? Um, the, according to our greenhouse gas inventory, um, you know, we need to really identify the emissions reductions that are necessary to achieve our 2045 target which is to be carbon net negative, um, which is to 
um, emit or sequester more um, carbon than we're emitting. Um, here you can see where we're at in the latest assessments, um, which is we're, we still got quite a ways to go. Um, we've gotten some uh, irons in the fire for federal funding requests. Um, DOA is applying for affordable clean energy grant. I wasn't able to find out how much they're applying for, but I think that's a good chunk that's going to be able to help um, reduce the costs for producing food by having um, renewable energy production um, at agricultural facilities. Um, the state and county are going in a, as a coalition to apply for $50 million of EPA grant funding for climate pollution reduction activities. So that's a wide swath of things from um, building retrofits to natural working lands activities, um, waste reduction, all those kinds of things that often fall through the cracks um, for federal funding opportunities. Um, DOT harbors applied for $30 million for um, retrofits to protect their harbors and make them more resilient to climate change. Um, UHC grant is leading a coalition of folks to apply for um, resilient communities through a NOAA grant um, to look at how to, from Malka to Mackay, to look at climate resilience. Um, and the Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority is applying for $100 million for additional loan funds to increase the number of rooftop solar available to um, Atlas communities. Um, the Hawaii business as usual model trajectory, um, in, even when we look at our increasing our renewable portfolio standards, um, we're, n we're set up not to meet our 2030 or 2045 state goals at this point in time. Um, so the Hawaii State Energy Office, um, through their decarbonization strategy and through Act 238, um, showed different pathways of, of how we could actually achieve that. Because right now, um, we're not on the path to do so. Um, so some of the things that we're going to keep doing um, is to increase our focus on equity. Um, the UH is working on an equity mapping tool. Um, we're going to continue investments and focus on energy rebates. Um, there's a lot of federal funding for that. And we want to make sure those get into the hands of the right communities, right people. Um, we want to continue to protect their watersheds um, and reach our goal of 30% of priority watersheds protected. Um, the state has also pledged to um, plant, protect, and conserve 100 million trees um, and also want to wrap, ramp up efforts managing um, wildfires and invasive species control. Um, all of these actions are, you know, funded through general funds from the legislature. So mahalo to all of you for funding them in the past and, you know, we hope we can continue to get funding in the future so we can carry on those actions. Um, we also have $1.5 million allocated to address urban heat with expanding our tree canopy through community grants, through our Ku'ulunani program. Um, you know, we also are scheduled to uh, have 100% state fleet transition for our, um, for our smaller vehicles by 2030. Um, we also, HDOT is working with airlines to convert ground supporting equipment to electric, also working with rental cars to do the same, um, rental car companies, improving community infrastructure to make EV ownership more feasible, um, and Department of Education is working on pilot programs in schools to compost food scraps um, so that we can divert the waste from um, our trash streams. So what else can we do and, and what do we need to do so that we can reach those goals for 2030 and 2045 that the legislature has set? Um, you know, there's so many different components of climate change. Um, I think Chip did a really good job of saying, you know, we're often narrowly focused on this decarbonization, um, which is a really important piece, but we really need to take a holistic view of all the different things that, that play into um, climate change. And that's basically everything that we do. Um, and climate change is going to also impact everything that we do. So, um, you know, there's a numerous number of things that we could do, but if I was to break it down to, to my top um, recommendations, I'd say um, passing the green fee um, in whatever form it is in this session, um, that's going to provide um, significant funding for um, DLNR, but also just 
general resilience. That's going to protect our water supply. That's going to protect our food supply because we need water for food. That's going to um, address, start to address sea level rise. Um, and that's also going to help us to look at climate change in um, a, a broader capacity. Um, and then the carbon cashback bill. Um, I know that has gone through a few times in the past sessions. Um, but this is really an equity piece where we're looking at reducing our um, demand on fossil fuels by making it more expensive, but also by giving funding back to communities who need it the most. So it's um, balancing both equity while addressing our, our um, need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, and then additional recommendations, the decarbonization strategy and the sea level rise vulnerability plan both have great recommendations outlined in them. And you know, if we were to work on these, everything from cesspool conversions to you know, ramping up our efforts to convert to EVs and energy efficiency to planting trees, you know, this kind of has it all. And so if we can fund and implement these recommendations, we'll be a lot closer to reaching our goals. Okay. Right. Mahalo. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Members, any questions? Okay, thank you. And then we will now have retired Hawaii Supreme Court Justice Michael Wilson, who is the founder of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, also founder of the Climate Crisis Commission of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and who's presently teaching a climate em emergency law and policy course at UH Law School. Welcome. Aloha. Aloha. And thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Representative. <coughs> Thank you for your Hello, patience. And, and Senator uh, Gabbard and Senator Richards. I have to say, one of my kapuna was your dad, Monty, when I was at the Water Commission. And one of the great things we did was to go up and enjoy ourselves at Kahua Ranch. But it's really wonderful to meet you. And I can see your dad. <laughs> OK, so I've been informed that I have five minutes. <laughs> no, no, you can go a little longer than that. Could you, could you give us okay. your presentation? We, we can, it'll yeah. be OK if we go. Yeah. But I think the best thing for my slides is maybe we can just go to my second slide that talks about emergency. Because to put a perspective on what I was going to suggest here is where the law meets reality. And in that sense, of course, a lawsuit is a truth testing of policy. And if you were to ask yourself the question whether a citizen has the right to go to court, to stop a private actor or a government from hurting them or injuring them, the answer is obvious. So that's happening all over the world. This is the biggest issue facing judges everywhere, climate change, and the effect on particularly, and we have some wonderful young people who are involved in this issue here in the audience. Um, and that's essentially the group that's moving forward, mothers and children all over the world. So what happened in Hawaii? You know, we have a policy history that pertains to mitigation and adaptation that's exciting. We have the father of our environmental court here that was formed in 2014 that's been the most prominent court in the United States on the environment at the trial level. Our Supreme Court is clearly the leader in the entire United States on climate rights. In the state of Hawaii, we have a right to a stable climate capable of supporting human life, which is really important to future generations. We also are the state, the first state that declared an emergency, actually formally declared an emergency. Great policy statements, enlightened, far-reaching. Let's talk about the lawsuits that test the truth of the policy and the actions that are being taken. We have a situation in two cases that are testing now the degree to which the policies that have been discussed here and global policies of, of course, the idea that we're going to protect the planet and future generations are being pursued or not. One is a case, you probably saw the article in the paper, where a group of young people in Hawaii have stepped forward and filed a lawsuit. Not asking for money, they're simply asking for the Department of Transportation to actually put a plan together. We've heard all the challenges they have, but to put a plan together because they have the biggest carbon footprint, you could call it a climate protection plan. And there has been a response that I think is very insightful for members of the legislature. 
You were asked to allocate a million dollars last session for one of the most aggressive law firms in the United States and clearly one of the most high priced, a law firm that's been criticized by a federal judge for overcharging. Depositions have recently been conducted where you have the young people being questioned by these attorneys from Los Angeles and they were so aggressive that the deposition resulted in this young woman breaking down into tears. And now you're being asked to supply two million dollars for loss uh, 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 hourly fees that are in excess of $750 an hour. That is this response of the state of Hawaii when there's a truth testing of whether the policies are being complied with. And the courts so far have said they have a claim. Over and over again, the attorneys have tried to throw it out of court and it hasn't happened and now it's going to trial. It's going to go to trial June 24th. So I'm just suggesting that now we're starting to see the reality of whether we're going to be able to address what's the most important issue obviously facing our, the young people in our community. Second lawsuit, very interesting. Maybe the most important lawsuit in the United States because for the first time the oil companies, the city and county of Honolulu is taking a different approach than the state. They have moved forward to represent the community. They have moved forward to try to hold accountable those that are causing injury. And it is an extremely, I would say, brave endeavor by the city and county because they've taken on the most powerful private interest in the world, the, the oil companies. And this is a case in which the city and county of Honolulu is alleging fraud on the part of the oil companies. Again, there's been an effort to throw the case out of court. It hasn't succeeded. It went to our Supreme Court after I was on the court and the court said this is a fraud case and it can go to trial. So now citizens of a state where the citizens have seen Lahaina burn to the ground, citizens of the state where they've seen a rain bomb destroy the north shore of Kauai, and citizens that are seeing what's happening to Waikiki are going to be able to sit as jurors. And ultimately, the issue, and I'll conclude with Waikiki, a litmus test or a truth testing of the degree to which we're able to contend with Climate emergency, of course, is this really important resource, Waikiki. There's no plan. It's an amazing thing that there's no plan. I mean, I'm sure there was a plan for rail. It's a big cost item, and there was a plan put together before the RFPs went out. But when it comes to the critical resource of Waikiki, there has not yet been a plan. And I would suggest that's one example that's going to be very pregnant it's going to be an extremely active area for constant litigation, unless the kind of work that we could depend upon from the University of Hawaii, from Dr. Fletcher, or from Leah Laramie, who is a hero at the Department of Land and Natural Resources, with their expertise, the participation of the community that would be the community of hotels, of course, the private sector, as well as a, a community that would include the leaders of our financial industry in Hawaii. Anyways, you could put a commission together that would at least address what we're going to do with this really important resource because it's flooding. You can't hold the ocean back. As Dr. Fletcher said, Waikiki is flooding now. <coughs> and it's going to become a florid problem. And, but the issues are profound. Do you open up the Alawai? Do you take down some of the hotels? Do you move some of the hotels? Or do you wait for the hotels to fall into the ocean? The technique that was used in the North Shore to just wait till the houses start falling into the ocean. So anyways, in terms of the law and where the law meets reality and climate justice, there is a lot of excitement that's taking place now. And I, I would submit that um, we can do it. But it, it's going to take a responsible approach to the idea of rec respecting the climate rights of future generations and, and the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so now we have uh, two student representatives
of the Climate Future Forum. The first is Reina Gamarino. She's a senior at Punahou School, and she's on Zoom. Oh, you're here. In <laughs> person. Here. <laughs> Hi, how nice. Uh, Reina has interned for five months with uh, Senator Brian Schatz, and she also founded the Student Advocates for Responsible Technology. Welcome, Reina. Um, I'm Audrey. Oh, you're um, Audrey. I think okay. on Zoom. Oh, Audrey's on Zoom. Okay, sorry. Oh, there. Okay. All set? Are we all set with Raina on Zoom? Here she is. Is that her? There she is. Welcome, Raina. You can go ahead. Okay, I'll begin. Um, so aloha everyone. My name is Audrey Lin. I'm 17 years old and I'm a junior at Yalani School. I'm joined by Reina, who is on Zoom, and a senior at Punahou School, and we are both youth leaders of the Climate Future Forum. First, we would like to start off by thanking the Energy and Environment and Agriculture and Environment Committees, as well as Senator Gabbard for offering us a chance to present our perspective. We would also like to thank some representatives who are not present today, um, Representative Peruso, oh, Representative Lowen, who is here, and Senator Rose for supporting the Climate Future Forum. Finally, we'd like to thank Senator Lee and Representatives Gar Garrett, Martin, and Sayama for participating and supporting CFF. Um, and in addition, I would like to just recognize the words um, that were just spoken by re retired Hawaii Supreme Court Justice Michael Wilson. Um, he mentioned where the law meets reality and the climate rights of future generations, um, which I think is a perfect segue into our presentation. Um, and with that, I'll pass it to Reina. I think she's on mute. Reina, I think you're muted. If we're running behind, I can <coughs> present if the Zoom doesn't work. Okay. Okay. Do you want me to just present? Do you want, uh, Reina, do you want to try to maybe disconnect and connect again and see if that works? Okay. And check your, check your mic input. Yeah. Okay, let's have, should we have um, Audrey go ahead? Sorry, okay. Reina. And then we'll come back to you, Reina, yeah. and see if, if you manage Keep to sort it out. Go ahead, Audrey, you can. Okay, so Reina and here, uh, Reina and I are here um, to kind of speak on behalf of the rest of the younger generation who see climate change as the most pressing issue facing our planet as we know her. And as we stand here, sea levels are rising, coral reefs are disappearing, ecosystems are shrinking, wildfires are burning, and humanity is being threatened by rising temperatures. So it's up to us. And the question now is what are we going to do? Well, one thing the Climate Future Forum hopes to do is highlight how climate change is such a multifaceted and intergenerational issue. And only after we recognize such issues can we call for necessary systemic changes. Oh, I think she's on. Hold on. After seeing the need for a medium for productive dialogue between youth, the legislator, and the legis Lature and environmental organizations, Raina and I worked with other young people and adults to establish the Climate Future Forum to fill that vacancy. 
Our work involves wielding political will to drive legislation in various areas. And during our recent December event, we met here in the halls of the Capitol, where we established climate priorities for the upcoming legislative session, turning dialogue into real action. Our priorities included sustainable food systems, as we called for SB 430, and new positions in the DOE and UHCTAHR. We advocate for your support of farm to school, school gardens, and food trees on school campuses. We advocate for farm to food bank programs, the restoration of traditional farming practices, and initiatives that reduce food waste or recover food resources. In addition, in regards to clean energy and transportation, we support solar on all newly constructed homes, zero emission vehicle purchasing, the establishment of green infrastructure, and the continuous monitoring of hazardous air pollution. And perhaps most importantly, to support just transition, the state should fund climate research, such as in HB 441 or SB 657, that identifies those most vulnerable to the consequences of climate change. And our youth organization emphasizes the passing of the green fee in whatever form to encourage sustainable tourism and the implementation of carbon cashback in 7B1004 and HB1146, which supports the equitable redistribution of resources. And building off of Mr. Fletcher's and Mr. Lau's previous points on investment, carbon cashback helps increase the price of fossil fuels and steer such investors towards clean energy. And our agenda may sound ambitious, um, but we are a state uniquely situated to spark international change, and our youth are certainly ready. Despite not being able to run for office or even vote in elections, we are, to be frank, not pleased with the current state of affairs that we are set to inherit. And now we want to take action. We see it as our job now to engage in public forums, utilize media as a vehicle for publicity, and create productive dialogue with policymakers to make our legislative priorities known. And as we recover from the Lahaina wildfires, we know classmates who give up their weekends to volunteer on Maui, and those like the Hawaii Youth Climate Coalition who rally to create true change from within the system, or people within our own organization who meet with legislators during their school lunches and write legislative testimony before doing their homework. Today, it is easy to be overwhelmed by the abundance of news articles that discuss the extinction of various species and the global destruction caused by natural disasters, parallel to the political and industry-based resistance to climate-friendly solutions and legislation. Audrey? Yeah. Raina's back on. Do you want her to finish? Sure. Okay. Raina? You following along, Raina? Hello? Can you, you guys, can you anyone hear me? Yes. However, venues such as our Climate Future Forum and this very briefing give us hope for the future. There are so many young people ready for systematic change, and I hope that the adults will just pause and listen. Thank you. <laughs> Short and sweet. Wow. Thank you guys so much for getting involved. This, you are our future. And just the fact that you've taken the time to, it's just really heartwarming for us as, as legislators. And you're already interacting with us and, and the things that you mentioned. Uh, yeah. What more can we do to continue this relationship? And I think such opportunities like the one that we've been given today have been a really great step. And also, we've met with many of you guys already to discuss our priorities. Um, and now it's just a matter of taking those ideas and like putting them into real legislative action. You got it. Thank you very much. You. Okay, folks. And with that, uh, we'll wind it down here with, uh, I'll ask Rep. Nicole to give some closing remarks. I mean, I think that the clock is ticking, so just a big thank you to everyone. It was a long um, afternoon, so thanks for being patient and appreciate, um, yeah, all of the presentations. So much information to take in, and I hope that a lot of people get to see it on YouTube as well. And for myself, a big hand for all of our presenters. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. So well, as was mentioned before, it's going to take all of us. Uh, the Kako thing was mentioned a number of times, right? And 
Lao Lima, many hands working together. So let's do this, okay? Mahalo.